Refueling Wing, McDill Air Force Base, Florida. His ministry ensures the readiness and spiritual resiliency of 19,900 employees and their families at McDill, including headquarters of U.S. Central Command, headquarters U.S. Special Operations Command, headquarters U.S. Marine Forces Central, headquarters U.S. Special Operations Command Central, and 31 other joint mission partners. He advises the six mission support group leadership on the religion, moral, morale, ethics, and, um, and provides for free exercise of religion. Um, want to thank him for his, um, for his outstanding service and his um, uh, uh, commitment to the community. And especially in times like these, I know your services are, are welcomed by our uh, great men and women serving our country and the, and the um, folks from around the world that are at McDill. So we'll um, all stand to let you pray, and then we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Councilor Carson, and uh, thank you for this invitation. I ask that you bow your heads and pray in your faith tradition as I pray in mine. Most precious and kind God, we want to take this time to say thank you for this gathering. We express our highest gratitude for the Community Redevelopment Agency and all of the members that are part of this great team. It is my prayer that you bless our seven council members and those that serve alongside them, alongside with them and that you would grant them the wisdom to lead and make decisions for over 400,000 constituents. Bless those who will be affected by, those, by the decisions that are made here today, and that you will allow them to grow and prosper and experience economic increase for the greater good of their families. We ask this blessing now. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Clerk Soto, can we have a board member roll call, please? Carlson? Here. Pertec? Here. Clendenin? Here. Meniscago? Here. Vera? Here. Miranda? Here. Henderson? Present. We have fiscal form. And adoption of the January 18th meet meeting. We have a um, motion. Well, who said so moved? Oh, thank you, Miranda. And second by, what's your name? Guida. Guida. <laughs> Maniscalco, board member Maniscalco. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, the adoption of the minute has been carried. Um, next, we need to, um, gosh, I had a brain freeze. I need my director of. What, what's your position? CRA director. <laughs> loud right. and proud. My CRA director. Okay, thank you. We'll get you some more coffee. I we'll appreciate it. Um, CRA director to go over today's agenda. Uh, we have some cleaning up to do. Awesome. Thank you so much, and good morning, board members. It's so good to see you. Uh, we're setting the agenda, and I am respectfully requesting item six to be continued until April 11th CRA board meeting. Thank you. Item nine, uh, to be received and filed. Okay, so we need, uh, we have a, a motion to continue item number six until April 11th by Miranda, seconded by Amanda Scalco. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Continue. Great, thank you. Uh, additionally, item nine, to be received and filed. So moved. Sorry. Okay. Kurdek, Clinton, and all those in favor. Aye. Great. Thank you so much. Um, additionally, item 10, requesting a continuance until April 11th. Oh, I'd like to move to, um, to continue item number 10 to April 11th and invite the CFO in addition to the um, executive director. Okay. Can I get a second? second. Thank you. Um, Carlson and Maniscalco, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Great, and uh, last one is item number 11 to be received and filed. I'd like to make a motion to receive and file item 11. Second. Carlson, Maniscalco, move to receive and file. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. And thank you to thank staff you for it. doing that research on that. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Okay, so can I have an adoption of today's minutes? So agenda, not minutes, agenda. Second. Okay, so who said? Okay, there you go, all those in favor? Aye. I can't hear up here this morning. Okay, I would like, before we go to public comment, I want for these wonderful children or students from 
Indianapolis, Indiana to stand up, the Elks Antlers Youth Group. They are here visiting us today. Look at these beautiful faces. The goal um, is this travel experience is to expose and train youth community for community involvement, air travel etiquette, mannerism, leadership abilities, and they are representing grades eight through 12, traveling to Tampa with five chaperones. Welcome to Tampa. So we, hope, we hope you enjoyed this experience. I know you're going to stay and listen to a few public comments, and you'll be headed over where to see the mayor. So thank you so much for coming, and we will, um, you know, hope that you have an amazing time in our great city. Thank you. Thank you. And if you move here, you need a really good job. Okay. Okay. So now we'll move on to public comments. Can I have a reminder, would you like to share some of the rules about public comment, Attorney Massey, before the public begins to speak? Yes, ma'am. Um, members of the public are allowed a reasonable opportunity at the beginning of the CRA meeting to address any item on the agenda before the CRA takes official action on an item. However, a three-minute time limit applies to all speakers providing public comment. Speakers and members of the public are, all, are reminded that they are to refrain from disruptive behavior, including making vulgar or threatening remarks or making or causing disruptive noises or sounds or displaying signs or graphics. Speakers are also reminded to refrain from launching personal attacks against city or CRA officials, staff members, or members of the public. The chair will rule out of order any person who speaks without being recognized or attempts to address the CRA from outside the speaker area at the podium. Persons failing to comply with these CRA rules may also be ruled out of order and that the discretion of the chair may be removed from the chambers for the remainder of the day's meeting. Finally, CRA members are reminded to refrain from engaging with speakers under public comment. Thank you so much, Attorney Massey. Good morning, and is not first. Uhuru. Mentesnot, I want to say Uhuru means freedom in Swahili, and we as African people should always be thinking about our freedom because for 624 years, we haven't been free. For 624 years, we haven't been free. And part of our freedom is reparations. Reparations that we're owed. $3 million per First Nation, per African, per indigenous person on this planet Earth. $3 million per person. So if you're black and you're not talking about reparations, you're not talking about nothing. If you're black and you're not talking about what white people owe us for 624 years of slavery, oppression, and mistreatment, you're not talking about anything. If you're Sunni Muslim and you're not talking about what's going on in Palestine right now, you're not talking about nothing. Period. And if you're working class and you're not talking about socialism, you're not talking about nothing. You might as well get out the political arena and get in the gossip arena and talk about Taylor Swift and who she's dating and who she isn't dating. But when you start talking reality, when you start talking about homelessness, when you start talking about education, when you start talking about housing, when you go around this city and you see people living on the sidewalk, and the city can't do anything to accommodate the poor and working class individuals in this city. That's not good at all. But it's not just in this city. It's throughout the world. A backward system. We have a lady they just put in prison, getting ready to put in prison a parent because they say she couldn't control her son, Jennifer Crumley. And nobody said one single word. Had a whole trial talk about, oh, this lady was paying attention to her horses. She was paying attention to her boyfriend, her extramarital affair. And they said one effing word about the gun manufacturers. Not one word about the gun manufacturers who's putting all kind of guns in society. Not one single word. They always talk about drugs and crime and say no to drugs and lock them up and all that. 
they don't say one single word about the pharmaceutical companies. The pharmaceutical companies cause more deaths of individuals with overdoses and other kind of illicit drugs they're pushing. Nobody say a word about the pharmaceutical companies. And I'm saying this city council have to get to reality and you just can't keep spoon feeding African people with the nonsense. Thank you, Ms. Next. Good morning, Council. Good morning. Julie McGill, I'm back to talk about construction services. What did you um, say your name was? Julie McGill. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, we keep hearing the word policy, policy, <laughs> policy. It's an unwritten policy. Us as contractors, it's a guessing game every single day. I don't know why you're sitting on your hands and not moving this into a motion. Um, they're circumventing you on purpose, and I hope the administration isn't intimidating you and not to make this motion. I'm pleading with you. Um, we can't read their minds, and I've got several cases of people that they're afraid to come forward because the city will come after them. They have retaliation tactics. Um, I don't know how much more I can stress this. I'm, I'm urging you to please make this an agenda item as soon as possible. Just picture someone in your family that was in this boat with the city and maybe that will help you make your decision. Thank you. Next public comment, please. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Pastor William, located at 1112 East Scott Street. And I've been coming down here many, many days, but nobody seemed to want to hear. But we, ne we need some help. I was in court there about a month ago, maybe a couple of months ago. And you know what? The judge told me I had to take my Bible out of there. And she didn't only tell me I had to take my Bible out of there, she put me out of there. And I wonder what kind of court system we have in camp for. Only want to judge black folk and want to penalize us for no reason at all. But you know what? When you got God, I don't care how y'all think about me. We got it all. I want to thank you, Jesus, for another beautiful day. One of my grandsons passed last week, and I want y'all to pray for me, the ones that know how to pray. If you don't know how to pray, then don't worry about it, because I'm doing all the prayer I need to do for myself and my family and all. You know what? God is so good to us. But we come down here with long faces like he owes us something. He owes us something, all right. He owes us a whooping for sin. That's what he owes us. But I got to give him the glory and the praise always. I wanted to read something to y'all, but I, I know y'all don't give me time to read it. But you know what? We got on the dollar bill, a penny, nickel, dime, in God we trust. And if we trust God, why don't we trust him? and give him the glory. No, we think that we don't owe God nothing, but we owe God everything. And when I say that, I'm speaking from the heart. I know one day I'm gonna leave here, coming down here now with my walk and everything. Nobody respect that, they don't care. And one time, one time I came down here, the mayor was down here. They didn't, wouldn't even let me in the door. I had to sit out there on the steps. I mean, that's ridiculous. People that come down here and wanna Help people, don't want to help them. But I got to tell y'all something. We just got to keep praying and trusting the Almighty God. We're going to be all right. Even if God takes us away from here, we're going to be good. And that's why I love to praise and glorify God. Thank y'all for hearing me today. Maybe I'll hear y'all another day. Good morning, Council. Eileen Henderson. Today, the hat I wear is the interim president for the historic Belmont Heights Neighborhood Association. I had a completely different comment prepared and at the last minute decided, you know, this isn't what I want to say. Three minutes is, a very difficult, is very difficult to convey a great deal of information, so when you do, it has to be powerful and it has to be impactful. 
So let me share with you the meeting last night with the historic Belmont Heights Neighborhood Association. There were residents there that all their lives, all they have known is Belmont Heights and its true boundaries. Boundaries that have been encroached upon as they watch history, their history, black history, slowly disintegrate and dissolve. There are members there who have family buried at Memorial Park Cemetery, who remember going to MPC when they were children and recalling how it was the only place they felt safe because of their skin color. There is pain in their eyes and bewilderment. And since they just can't seem to make sense of the way they are treated, you can see, you can feel, they will just accept whatever they can get. <clears throat> well, let me tell you something. That is not good enough, and that is not acceptable. We had a young lady at the meeting last night from USF. Her name is Jordan with the Black Cemetery Network. In the short amount of time she's been gathering data and researching Hillsborough, his historic Belmont Heights and the cemetery, she made a very profound statement. Now keep in mind that she is not from Tampa. She's an outsider, if you will. So her view is purely objective. And what she said is, and I quote, Belmont Heights history is Tampa's history. Let that sink in. So council, we need a fence. Not a temporary fence. We need a permanent fence, period. I did some digging, and the Cemetery Society requested a fence back in May of 2022, two budget cycles ago. Really? Come on, get us a fence. Next, did you know there's a new neighborhood association? Yep, it's true. I sent an email a while ago asking to reestablish the historic Belmont Heights Neighborhood Association boundaries, and I'm asking you, stop allowing for these new associations. Figure out Tampa's sections, and then you can have the smaller sections in those that are already established and have been established. Stop erasing our history. Please, I am begging you, do the right thing. And remember, Belmont Heights history is Tampa's history. Thank you. Good morning. Reverend Dr. Gabriel Morgan of St. Paul Lutheran Church and here today representing the Hillsborough Organization for Progress and Equality. Uh, I want to say first of all that we are encouraged by the memo that we received on steps that are being taken uh, to work on two of the seven ponds in East Tampa and to make improvements to them. Uh, we were encouraged also by, by the commitment of the CRA to dedicate funding to that despite an inability to acquire some additional funding from outside sources. We recognize the challenges that are involved in that and we commend all of you for that. I also want to reaffirm Hope's commitment to the need for affordable housing, a campaign which we have worked on extensively with the county, if not directly with the city, and which I've spoken on at length as well. I recognize that there are a number of challenges that you must address, and rightfully so, and I was appreci especially appreciative of Councilmember Miranda's comment, if I will paraphrase, I don't want to misquote you, uh, that given the magnitude of these crises, the majority of our efforts and funding ought to be dedicated to housing and the environment, and we couldn't agree more. Uh, the one thing that I would like to ask that you consider, and which we mentioned to Councilmember Maniscalco in our meeting with him this week, uh, is that the amount of attention and resources going to the uh, 26th Ave Pond versus the 22nd Avenue Pond are, are dif different significantly. And I just want to commend to all of you how valuable that location of the 22nd Street Pond is. We recognize that extensive amenities may not be possible in all seven ponds in East Tampa, but if there is any pond that's worthy of more attention and support, it is at 22nd Street Pond. We're going to have a vigil there, uh, February 29th at 3 p.m., and we're going to have lots of local participants outside of our own organization, such as with the Healthy 22nd Street Initiative, an amazing community garden project that's been spearheaded by Kitty Wallace. Members of that uh, group are going to be there with us. We would ask those of you whose schedules permit to please join us for that and to try to envision with us the possibilities for the community there. But at the very least, we hope that it will get uh, a little bit of cleaning and support in addition to uh, some of the other investments that are being made. 
Let me just again thank you uh, for the attention that you're bringing to this issue, and, and please continue to move forward, and we look forward to future updates. Thank you. Good morning, Connie Burton. The issue uh, number nine, eight, the retention ponds, seem to be fast rolling beyond the request of home ownership rehab. We didn't talk about that five years, and yet it has not been grounded that members of our community that is asking for assistance, if it's coming out of the CRA budget, there's a 15-year lien that could be placed on individual houses, but if the money is coming from the city, then it's a 30-year lien. We cannot close the gap of generational wealth in our community. And I'm glad these young people are here this morning because hopefully when it's their turn to make real decisions that will balance equality for everybody, this will resonate. How people are continuing to come before this council and ask that you resolve some of the hard questions. Dr. King said the issues of voting rights and integration was easy solved. But the issues of equality, slum, and blight that according to the Florida statute that the CRA is formulated around, you can't bring yourself to do it. You can't bring yourself to say that inside of our community, we have an insurmountable amount of poverty and blight, and yet and still, it's nowhere on the agenda. We have asked city staff to step forth and tell us how can we do accessory dwelling units in our community so we can start creating those things. It's not on the agenda. When do you hear what the people say? So now East Tampa, the change in the dynamics of East Tampa, and now the agenda is changing. That we don't even want to say Belmont Heights anymore, Jackson Heights. It is blanket into something brand new. I want to remind you that you signed a resolution in 2020 when you was conducting all of the other city business over at the convention center during the COVID. You handled the resolution and you said that you recognized the harm that this city did as it related to policies and practices that was that worked against the interests of the African community. It does us no good, and it should not give any of you cover when members of the council say it's not their issue. It is your issue. It is your issue to ensure that African Americans that help build this city will see that their work has not been in vain and that the issues of our community that we continue to advocate for is addressed soon. Good morning. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Oh, my name is Sally Issy Lee with the Volunteer Missionary Society Penny Fund. And I have a miracle happen to me this morning. I had just say, well, I'm not going to go back and keep begging and not being heard and disrespected. And all of a sudden, the alarm went off. I had made all the excuses I could, the reason why not to come. The alarm just went off, and I just rolled over. I said, there's no smoke, nothing. I got up. And God said, I'm calling you, and I want you to go to City Hall. And I'd never been woke up by a smoke alarm with no smoke in the house. And I, that's why I'm here, and I'm going to use my three minutes, I would just like to say, about desert spaces in our community. Empty spaces. And we, I have written out 5,000 miles walking, cleaning and all that, walking in the rain, talking to God about our share for a juvenile center. Mr. Maddis, Councilman Maddis Scalco, he been over there. Nobody else has came except Miss C.T. And she do her job as a navigator. And I was just, I said, I can't no more. He said, go down there and ask again. 
It's an empty space. Nobody given but the sisters. And my voter's card said, City Council 1, 2, 3, and 6 that need to be working on this. I am a citizen, a good citizen, a donor of the year citizen of the year. Y'all haven't put anything in it, but you want to put our kids in jail. I keep thinking about this little boy and praying for him. I don't know his name. He goes to Wharton School. And now he's 14, facing 20 years of prison. I know how to raise kids. Ask me how many doors I kicked in. But I got my kids where they need to be. I want to help. I know how to discipline and raise kids to have fun. And I want y'all to reconsider this. Kevin and Chief Bennett, I'm always calling the secretary. She always answers me, Phyllis. But I want y'all to take some kind of action to help me open this center. Think about it, and they won't have no prison to pipeline because they'll be in the center with me. And y'all, please don't ignore me. I've been working with the um, Tampa House with everybody. And that's what my card say, one, two, three, and six. Supposed to be helping me with this. I told you I never had a smoke alarm to wake me up. God say, come down here and talk to y'all, and that's what I'm doing. Overlook it. It's on you now. I've done what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to probably need a little help with that. Good morning, um, City Councilwoman. And I want to start off by saying um, my representative, uh, Councilwoman Henderson, my prayers are with you and your family. And it's good to see you here this morning. My name is Noreen Copeland Miller, and I am uh, the Secretary of Historic Bama Heights Neighborhood Association. I'm also a resident of Bama Heights 30 years plus, the founder of the Friends of Bama Height Memorial Park Cemetery. I'm here this morning to speak about item number seven that um, is on the agenda or on, and I'm grateful, and I want to be grateful to Councilman Vieira for his due diligence and always showing up at Memorial Park Cemetery, not just showing up, but working in the cemetery with the restoration piece of the headstone, the cleanups, you're there. I want to also thank Councilman Maniscalco for his participation coming up, not just showing up, but working with the community at Memorial Park Cemetery, as well as Councilwoman Henderson. With her short period of time there, but she's been to the cemetery, participated with us, and when she can't make it, her aid is there. So I want to thank you all because I know you hear us. I know you're committed to the community. We know that you know about the Historic Bama Heights Neighborhood Association. We know that you know about the Historic Bama Heights community. You are born and raised in Tampa. I know I am a Tampanian, a sixth generation. And so when I look around and see that I received this email, copied on it from this new person in Parks and Rec, that said about our request, we had put in the CRA budget over almost two years ago, monies to put up uh, fencing so we could secure Memorial Park Cemetery. That never did materialize because we still uh, there, but when I received this email saying that the CRA board rejected it, I was, I was just thrown away because I know I come to the meetings. I want to think I'm engaged in my community, and I never, ever knew that you guys, the board, rejected the request for the fencing. But that was in the email. But since that has happened, um, and I know he's new, I'm going to give him a pass from Parks and Rec on that. But before we send out erroneous information, I think we need to do some research. I certainly do before I said, because the words in that email were offensive to me, talking about a nudge. It was not a nudge. It was a follow-up from an email that had been sent to all of you guys. And I think Vieira responded from his office. But we are just wanting to make sure we get our, what this community deserves, what this cemetery deserves. We have people in there that gave up their lives to make sure that we can live safely in this country. And I like to say private 1329 service general engineer in the United States Army. My grandfather served there, and he's buried there, and he certainly deserves more. And my brother was in the military. He served there. But this morning, God woke me up to say about Historic Belmont Heights Neighborhood Association. 
I would love that we could have some continuity because I want to look over and say Southeast Bama Heights. I want to look over and see North Bama Heights. I want to look over and see Old Bama Heights. We have new people moving here that do not want to acknowledge Bama Heights. Please. Thank you so much for your time. And as I put the sign up because I wanted you all to see that we still have the same signage that we've asked for over a year ago to get a sign for Historic Bama Heights. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Bishop Michelle B. Patty. I would like to start off by saying that I'm in full support of preserving historical Bellman Heights. Uh, I grew up in Hyde Park, attended Doverville Elementary, a school that was a wooden building and that it was erased away. And now the only time we talk about that historical building is during uh, Black History Month. My visit here is twofold. I also have a brother 60 years ago that was buried in Memorial Park Cemetery. And because my mother was a divorcee, she could not afford a headstone at that time. So my brother is one of those that is uh, unmarked. Don't know if people have been buried on top of him or what's going on. But I am in full support of a fence being erected around that cemetery because I witnessed firsthand just a few years ago during election time when people were barbecuing in that cemetery, handing out meals, standing on people's graves, when people was putting signs in that yard in the uh, Memorial Park. Also, you see uh, trash and debris, all kind of things that is disrespectful to those lives that are there, those souls. So it is incumbent on this city. We want to thank the mayor, thank the city council, those of you that got the uh, cemetery and got it back in the hands of the community. Now we need to go a little further in preserving it. There's no harm in erecting a fence around the whole perimeter to make sure that it stays beautified, make sure that the upkeeping is uh, there. So we're going to ask this council to do what you say you was going to do, and that's to put the fence up. Not yesteryear, but let's do it as quickly as possible because we do care about our loved ones as others in other cemeteries do. So, you know, all this every week coming down here fussing and screaming and hollering about preserving African-American history, that should be a thing of the past. It is history, as you already heard, that this is our history. The story shall be told, and we want to preserve what is left of our history. Those of you that remember Central, West Temple. These was uh, places, High Park, that uh, African Americans, we were entrepreneurs, we was business owners, we was homeowners, and all that has been eroded because now you have urban manure that has come through, you have uh, interstates, you have everything that has taken over our history. So we're standing in the gap for the loss, we're standing on shoulders, those that paved the way for us, and we're asking this council to do what's respectful, do what is right on behalf of the African American community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, before I ask you to remind public comments for while we young folks from Indiana, in Indianapolis, um, please um, sit quietly that you refrain from referring to council members or board members directly by name. Whether it's good or bad, you should not be stating our names. You direct, direct your comments to the board um, as a whole. Thank you, Mr. Clinton, yes, for that reminder. You know, like Bob Rose. Safe travels, y'all. <laughs> yeah, but, well. But, yeah. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Hi, my name is Simon Rowe. I'm here in support of the Belmont Heights Neighborhood Association. Um, I'm just here out of concern for the fencing around M Memorial Cemetery. cemetery. Um, just to make sure that there is permanent fencing eventually installed. It is, cemeteries are a part of history, and especially Memorial Park, Memorial Cemetery. And yeah. That was basically the gist of what I wanted to say and why I was here. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Next speaker, please.
Good morning. Good morning. Before the clock starts, I want to ask, I don't know if it's possible, but as COVID continues to arrive and everything else, is it possible in between these speakers that we can wipe this down in between or have something here so we can wipe it down? I mean, we can bring it, but if we forget, could we have something up here as we touch and navigate this equipment that belongs to the city if some wipes could be made available for the public as we come? Because I forgot, and I usually bring them myself not asking you to do it so I'm, I'm here today my name is Keela McCaskill I'm, I'm filled with so many concerns and and I want to see our community better so I'm going to take these next three minutes to see if I can uh, be intentional hopefully it's purposeful and articulate the the main concern I want to know what will it take for you as a body to sit CRA and City Council what will it take um, for us to see some of the action that's necessary. Here we are in one of the greatest cities to live in, in the state of Florida, but yet we're in the middle of a housing crisis and our leadership has an aggressive, somewhat exaggerated goal of 10,000 affordable housing units. During their campaign, they said that we were well over half of that goal. That was said and there has been no, um, to me, acceptable response to that from the one body that can make the administration be accountable. That lie, as what I'm gonna call it, was told, and I'm not sure where they got the information from. It could have been the staff. It could have been misinformation. It could have been misunderstood. It could have been misrepresentation. I'm not sure what it was, but we can accept that and not respond accordingly. We only had 548 affordable units. Whether it was a mistake, it's unacceptable. We are in what they've deemed the greatest city to live in in the state of Florida. What will it take for you, the body, that can make them accountable to get some results? Because we still haven't heard the plan. We still haven't heard what you're going to do as a result of that. People are waiting. They've made plans in, quote, unquote, the greatest city to live and waiting on these affordable units that are, will become available. We only have... 548, what will it take for you, the only body that can make them be accountable to, to, to make something happen? It reflects on you. All of you ran a campaign on affordable housing. We trusted, we believed that you would do what's best for the people that can vote for you. At the time, what we had to say about housing, you knew it was important because in your campaigns, you made it the priority. Now we want you to hear our voices as we share some of the ideas the community has. You know, our fate should be determined by the community, not the administration. So if it fails, it shouldn't be because the administration had a bad plan. I'm asking you to come to the community, come to the organizations that represent the community, the people that are involved in making sure that they get development to happen. I want you to spend some time before this workshop. Come listen to those organizations. Come listen to the communities. Pay attention to what the people that voted you in office has requested, their ideas, what they would like to see in addition to what the staff gives you as information. What will it take for you to make this administration be accountable for the affordable housing, our biggest need in this city? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, there should be enough I have a couple things to talk about, but one of, one of the things I want to talk about is on the agenda, um, the Union Station. Um, we had a uh, preservation. Your name for the record, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Stephanie Pointer. <laughs> Stephanie Pointer. I, I know. I, I'm, I'm trying to be incognito. Um, we had a meeting at Union Station a couple weeks ago. There's like a fan certificate, accommodation, all kinds of stuff on this wall. And this is what the room looks like. The ceiling is literally falling in. The paint is peeling off the walls. I, I'm like, why has it taken so long to get anything done? I, you know, that's just me. Those are the things that I saw on the 30th when I went to the preservation uh, roundtable meeting. Um, the, the real reason why I came here today is um, I, I want to make sure that everybody is aware of this uh, Section 27150, specifically B and B2. Um, it says that if city council denies a rezoning, it's supposed to be a year before it comes back, unless there are significant changes to it. Um, I would like to also point out that significant changes, what it looks like, the size, whatever, um, the bottom line is that 
if the city council turns it down and they come back with something look, that looks the same and smells the same, then why are we wasting everybody's time? When you have neighbors who do this as volunteers, they should not have to come back less than a year later for the same sandwich just in a Ziploc bag instead of being in saran wrap. I mean, let's be realistic. I wanna make sure that when city council understands that when they do decline something that they're using the land use code and those numbers in front of it because I think that's gonna be very important to us. But I wanna make sure that folks understand. I, I really have an issue with things coming back before council and it hasn't been 12 months. It's a real problem. And but I'm not talking me, about I, any particular case. Okay. I am talking because about life in general. I haven't mentioned any cases. Tonight. And so I have, anything I have that not, deals with that, any cases tonight need no, to be No, sir. Organized. I have not talked about anything QJ. I am talking about the code. And the code says a year. It can be accepted by the zoning administrator. I don't know that I necessarily enjoy that process because that takes that away from you. They are piling more jobs on top of you less than a year after it's been here before. I don't care who it is. It shouldn't be back with a different packaging. Um, just making sure you, you call out the code. That's really, really important. And let's get this, um, the union station on the, on the agenda to get it fixed. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. <laughs> tech, tech, tech. Good morning, Council. Good morning. Uh, Robin Lockett. Uh, I'm on a different tip today. It's about the uh, workshop that I'm so excited about on the 29th. Just telling Council, please do not get amnesia about what you voted for in the budget and what that money is for. Let's go and move forward with what was outlined. And also, as it was said during budget time, that this should not be the first thing, right? Because housing is a, there's a housing crisis, and there'll be one for a long time. So the money has to be continuous, figuring out a way, how do we continue this so that the great work that uh, Nicole Travis's team has done can continue. That's all I want to say. And good seeing you yesterday, uh, Lewis. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good morning, morning Council. Please. Thank you for having me here today. Good morning. My name is Jordan Myrick, and I am a researcher with the Black Cemetery Network at the University of South Florida, and I'm also here in support of Belmont Heights Neighborhood Association and advocating for fencing being put around Memorial Park Cemetery. As a researcher with the Black Cemetery Network, we are assigned different cemeteries around the, around the U.S. and doing research on the history of those places and, at, and sharing that history with, with the people of that state and also with the wider nation in order to create a database. The cemetery that I was assigned was Memorial Park Cemetery and back in September. And in that short span of time, I have found out so much about that history, about what it means to Belmont Heights, and also how it speaks to the wider history of Tampa Bay. Not only does it have the only known African-American um, memorial for African-American veterans in the state of Florida with over 900 veterans buried there since 1919. Uh, but it's also, the play, it's also the final resting place of Richard Doby, who, who created Dobyville. And with Dobyville, I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but it's one of the first historically black site, um, cities in Tampa, communities in Tampa, I apologize. And it has led to the creation of black schools, black districts, black places of celebration, black places of peace. And not only that, but it also is a place of rest and communion for the people in this community. I've heard stories from different community members. They go there still to have picnics with their family members who have, just, who have been buried there for a while. They still have events there. They have cleanups. They have um, community barbecues there where they share the history. And then they advocate for the lives that were buried there. 
um, but it currently does not have fencing around it. And because of that, it has made it vulnerable to people coming to that coming onto that site and not treating it with the respect that it, that it deserves. There is people. There are people who come on and litter. They leave cigarette butts. There are people who come on who come and they desecrate the um, the graves. And that should, just should not be because cemeteries are a sacred place. And Memorial Park Cemetery is not only a place of rest, but it's also a historic site in the city of Tampa. So I'm just here to advocate for fencing to be put up around the area and respect for it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Murray. Okay, that concludes like that concludes public comment. Yes, count, um, Board Member Carlson. Uh, yes. Th there's one speaker I think online. Online? Oh, yeah. I apologize. Is we have one speaker online, Michael Randolph. Good morning, Mr. Randolph. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Michael Randolph, and I'm with the West Tampa CDC. Today, I come with a heavy heart. I pose the question, what will West Tampa look like in the next three years? 18% of the population of West Tampa consists of African Americans. 22% of people that live in West Tampa live in poverty. When I came here in 2001, the population of African Americans was way high. People are losing their house in West Tampa. Let me give a hypothetical case, the case of Tara Thompson. She's a poor, low-income person that lives in West Tampa. She's trying to get help with her roof. She lies to work every night wondering if her house is going to be taken from her. She has kids. Actually, this is not a hypothetical case. This is the case of a mother, a grandmother, that's about to lose her house in West Tampa. Her current situation is that she cannot afford to pay for her roots to be fixed. And her grandkids and her have to live in this situation. The current program says that she has to have some money to put up in order for her to get help from the city. Low-income people don't have this money. I pose the question again, what will West Tampa look like in the next three years? This video that I produced to talk about her case has gone viral. viral. We got people from around the country asking, what's going on in Tampa? 18% of the African-American population 22% live in property. They have houses that they own. They're going to lose their house because of this. What will West Tampa look like in the next 10 years? I did a video with this lady, and as I was talking to her, she started crying. Her 11-year-old tried to comfort her. This is going on throughout Tampa, not only in West Tampa. It, it, it's almost, I'm trying to not to bring the tears, because when you look at this lady and you look at her kids trying to comfort her, and she's going to lose her house only because of her income. Please, I ask you to take this case up with Ms. Taya Thompson. Please. This community is being gentrified even more now because people can't pay to fix their house. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Randolph. Board Member Carlson. Yes. Um, I, in the in the in the public comment, several people mentioned the fence around Memorial Park Cemetery. I don't see it specifically on the agenda, but I wanted to ask. Uh, there was a statement made that, uh, that the the head of park sent an email to a member of the public who's still here to say that the CRA or the City Council had voted against the the fence. I, Morris, do you happen to remember? I I'm not aware that we ever voted against the fence. <laughs> to my recollection, that's never been brought before you all. Yes, it was. So, so I think Mr. Drumko may be able to get, shed some light on the status yes. of things. So. I remember Nicole um, coming before us to discuss it. Yes, well, good morning, CRA good morning. Board. Uh, Elise Drumgo, for the record, Deputy Administrator for Development and Economic Opportunity. Uh, there was an email that went back and forth uh, between some of the staff and, and the public on this. And that staff member was corrected that the CRA board did not vote against or decline that. Uh, yes, they, yeah, you all did not decline 
uh, to install that fence. Uh, as you recall, there was a lot of back and forth relative to the possession of the cemetery itself. And at the time, you know, we, we could not go forward and install fence on property that was not held by the city. And so in this case where we received uh, possession of the cemetery, uh, the administrator and I, we sat down and we looked at this and we really didn't want to install a fence on two sides because those two fences, those materials would be on different life cycles. They would look different. They would be of different uh, composition. And we wanted to make sure that the cemetery also had, um, I would say, more of an elegant entry feature. And so uh, we worked with the parks team to design some entry columns with brick uh, cladding and we proposed the fence uh, through to the Parks Department with the CRA continuing to be that funding mechanism. Um, and to date that, unfortunately, it didn't go out to bid as we requested at the time. And so that was, that's been the holdup is that bid process. The fence itself, um, and part of that is, is due to the city's procurement as well, because we do have on the two sides, uh, we have those fencing contracts that we could have just come in and put in fence on the two sides and it would have fit under that cap of what, it, um, of what it costs to, to actually implement and stay under that, that cap of that contract. But the proposed scope that we had was beyond that, and so it required a separate RFP, and we could not go directly with that contractor. And have we already voted as CRA board to fund that, or are you gonna come back to us at some point? So it's already in the budget. You do have a historic okay. preservation line item as well. We're working on some other aspects of improvements to the historical marker within the park, within the cemetery as well, excuse me. So those items will not need to come back to you, and we are able to fund those. I wonder if you or Ms. Moody could maybe provide the RP information or whatever, just update to the members of the public who are here who asked about that, just so we can make sure that we correct the record from apologize you were given the wrong information, but we'll, yes. we'll make sure that the, the, yes. the correct and, and information is given to you. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. Thank you for addressing that. Okay, we will hear from our director. Um, no, next is um, our public, our um, CAC report. Good morning, Courtney Orr, interim urban core development manager. Good morning. It is the downtown community advisory committee's turn to provide an update on activities and accomplishments that they are working on. And today I have the pleasure of welcoming Daniel Tragat. Uh, to uh, speak on those activities. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Good morning. As Courtney mentioned, my name is Dan Trogett. I'm the vice chair of the Downtown CRA Citizens Advisory Committee. Uh, as you know, the Downtown CRA CAC has had some recent high profile projects, such as the Strath Center expansion and Tampa Theater Grant, which are still in the formative stages. Some other projects we've recently presented. Uh, that were recently presented to the CAC for input include Encore's Lot 10, the Gasworks Project, as well as the Tampa Museum of Art expansion. Since the CRA board has received comprehensive presentations on this project in December, I will not be including those specific items in this report. Our CAC's membership includes a talented variety of citizens, including people with backgrounds in architecture, commercial facilities, and instruction, construction management, civil engineering, project management, urban sustainability, arts administration, small business entrepreneurs, as well as residents who live in downtown Tampa, including myself. In January, we also welcomed Casey Bauer as the Tampa Downtown Partnership's new representative to our CAC. And this month we welcomed Ray Wong, who is a commercial architect, to fill our at large seat. So we have a wide variety of very talented people with a lot of experience in a lot of different areas, and we feel confident that we can give you good advice from our from our um, committee. The CAC also aligns and partners with the Downtown Tampa Partnership. I'm sorry, the Tampa Downtown Partnership, why would you reverse that for some reason, which provides updates at all of our meetings. Also, we partner with Friends of the Riverwalk, who has a representative that attends all of our meetings and provides updates and information. We also partner with the Downtown River Rocks Neighborhood Association, also known as DRANA, and they are represented with an ex officio seat on our CAC. One of the biggest ongoing projects of the CAC has been working on the update to the downtown community redevelopment plan. 
consultant Kittleson and Associates, KAI, uh, is updating the downtown CRA's community redevelopment plan from the 1983 original core plan and the 1988 amendment. Today's presentation details the outline of the CR CRP inclusive of high level existing conditions, an overview of outreach efforts, needs categories for which the CRP is based on, and project priorities. The needs categories to be discussed include environmental infrastructure, land use and economic development, transportation, public safety and quality of life, affordable and attainable housing, urban design, and historic preservation. Now, Kittleson has completed about 80% of the scope of the work to date, including community engagement, stakeholder engagement, CRA board member engagement, some of you have been interviewed, um, existing conditions analysis, and CRP report writing. The remaining items to be completed in this project include CRA board attorney review, presentation to the CRA board, and CRA board motion for approval. Some other projects, we've had a busy year, so some other projects we've been working on. A beneficial bridge study is evaluating the best way to expand the river walk past Beneficial Drive. Now this is important as an opportunity to increase public access to the waterfront within downtown and the Channel District and extend the river walk past Beneficial over to the cruise terminals in the aquarium. So a study is being done to figure out whether the river walk goes under the bridge, over the road, whatever, and uh, that's being uh, uh, conducted with city staff working with uh, mobility. Since Beneficial Drive sits on the border between the downtown CRA and the Channel Side District CRA, uh, both CRAs are expected to split those costs 50-50. Uh, Kid Mason Center redevelopment status. The project of redevelopment of Kid Mason is in progress. Uh, this is a renovation of an older building which has served many generations in the neighborhood. And so as is expected with any older building, you're gonna hit little hiccups. And so right now there's, a, 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 I'm sorry, um, Roof, de roof delays is in for permitting for, for um, roof uh, <coughs> reconstruction needs for that project, but it is underway and progressing. Herman Massey Park redevelopment, uh, construction plans have been approved. A funding reallocation request uh, will be coming to the CRA board to fill a funding gap from the contractor's estimate after which the construction bid will be released. This project is a partnership with the Parks Department and Contract Administration, and it's uh, been on the books for several years, so CAC members have expressed that they'll be excited to get this project, see this project get underway. Uh, downtown wayfinding signage study. I'm sorry, let me reorganize my notes here a little bit. Uh, Okay, so API Plus is the consultant for downtown wayfinding signage study. It's also item number three on your agenda today, so you'll be hearing more about it late, later. Mm -hmm. um, they presented concepts and uh, design concepts to the CAC uh, a couple of meetings ago, and we weighed in on preference of style, uh, style of signage to them at that time. In a similar project to the wayfinding signage study, the downtown Tampa, partner, Tampa Downtown <laughs> Partnership has presented their neighborhood branding project to the CAC uh, to brand different neighborhoods in the downtown area. Uh, the CAC was presented with uh, downtown neighborhood identifying names, designs, logos, et cetera, that would uh, denote different neighborhoods in downtown. CAC members provided feedback to the downtown partnership for this. Tampa Union Station, which is included in today's uh, agenda under the Facilities Department update, uh, the design consultant has completed 60% of the design for Union Station and is working towards 90% design completion. And as I mentioned, facilities will provide a timeline and current budget in the, their presentation later in this meeting. At our CAC meeting this week, the Tampa Downtown Partnership came to the downtown CRAC, CAC to review and present 
the culmination of several years of their work, work on a detailed study for, the, for a proposal for Franklin Street improvements. The partnership presented several study reports concerning Franklin Street improvements over the past couple of years to us leading up to the proposal that they presented to us this week. The CAC voted unanimously to recommend fully funding the proposed um, Franklin Street Improvement Project to the CRA Board, and hopefully you'll see information on that soon. Thank you, and thank you for all you do for our city. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Any questions? Board member or Ted? Uh, I just want to say thank you yes. for this very um, thorough uh, report. And it's, um, it's great that so many of these things that you've talked about are actually on our agenda today or coming forward. So uh, just want to thank you and your colleagues for the work you've done and the service thank that you. you're providing. And uh, thanks for moving, moving your CAC forward. Thank you. Okay. Board Member Carlson. Yeah, I also want to thank you for the great presentation. Um, just I haven't had a chance to meet you yet. Look forward to having coffee or something. But um, just wanted, if you haven't heard me talk about it in these meetings, I wanted to let you know the context that at least I'm working in is that um, the areas like South Tampa that subsidize the CRAs are okay subsidizing places like East Tampa, West Tampa. But when it comes to Channel Side and, and uh, downtown, they're very concerned that we're spending money on things that are nice to have instead of things that we need. And so as you all go through this process, can you please think like we do um, almost every day uh, or several times a day, I'm talking to uh, homeowners whose roads look like the worst I've ever seen anywhere in the world. And they say, why am I paying X amount for taxes and you can't fix these roads? And they know that a lot of the money is trapped in downtown and, and channel district. And we have on our agenda at some point to talk about cutting back on downtown uh, some but I, my point is just to ask everybody on the CAC, please think about the context. Um, everything you talked about is fantastic, and I've always been a big promoter of downtown. I want to support downtown. But right now, we're at a critical time where the public doesn't want us to raise taxes, and they want us to fix their roads, and they want us to fix basic infrastructure. So please, as you are looking at these things, if you can help us figure out what are the things that are really important to have, and what are the things that that are, are nice to have, but if we have to pay people's roads first, maybe we would do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our director's report is up next. Good morning. Good morning, board. Erica Moody, CRA director. Moving into the director's update item. Uh, so have a few key deliverables that we're working towards that I want to highlight. Um, our team is working really hard uh, through the restructure to stabilize the departments around grants, housing, um, project management, and our administration. So we are making great progress, and some of the deliverables will start to come forward uh, to the board and also uh, to the public. So one of the key ones that we're working towards is the housing implementation plan, uh, really working together as a team. Uh, we've been meeting all week on it just to finalize the last few details to come uh, and bring forward on February 29th at the City Council special call meeting. Uh, part of that, too, is bringing the information to the public and making our rounds to the CACs, and we will be doing that as well. It's important to distinguish that we have grants, but we have two different types of grants. We have housing grants, and we have commercial grants. So the housing grants uh, will be heard during the February 29th, and then the commercial economic development grant side will be coming to the board on March 21st. So we're really excited to streamline these efficiencies and make it way easier. So we're not taking away, but we're rather blending it together so we can uh, get these projects done faster, quicker, and uh, just get that money spent and, and the key deliverables that come with that. We also have a state mandated annual report. So CRAs all around the state of Florida are required to post their annual report by March 31st of each year. So we're working aggressively towards that timeline. We expect to have a completed draft by the end of this month. And then of course, uh, sharing it with our stakeholders so we can make it, make it perfect. And really just showcasing everything that we've done in the fiscal year 2023. And um, we're wanting an award winning report. So really working on the graphics and integrating our new brand and using that um, to start to establish our identity and, and have those key features. And then as we move forward, and you'll hear more as we 
as I continue to update in the director's report, but we're really bringing the objectives of the CRA board forward. So making sure everything that we're doing is in line with, of course, the state statute, of course, the community redevelopment plan, but also the priorities of our board, which we know changes as new people come in. Uh, but that's why the retreat was so important, because it helped us really land at the key priorities. And that's what we're really focused on moving forward. So uh, really excited to continue to bring that to the forefront and just explain how it all goes through this, this matrix uh, to weigh you know, the most appropriate uh, projects for CRA funding. So we're also very excited to um, publish that annual report, be on the lookout at the end of March. And then CRA relocation. So our staff, as you know, is in a few different locations in Ybor, East Tampa, and downtown. And we are looking for a project where we can get into one of the CRA uh, areas and partner with, with um, the right partners to, to build an office space. But of course we know that'll take time. And one of the biggest pain points right now is we're not with each other. Uh, we, it's spread out in communications. It's, it's just really hard to work as a team when you're in multiple areas. So uh, everyone's excited about this. We'll be moving uh, to the second floor of the um, TMOM, the municipal building across the street from city council. So you can come knock on our doors, and, and we're really wanting to welcome the community. We're going to be putting our branding, have our mission displayed, have the objectives around the office, and really just tune into our why and, and invite the community to be a part of it. So we want community to come upstairs on the second floor, ask us questions about our grants, tell us your ideas, your dreams, and, and we can see you know, how, how it fits within the work that we're doing. So really just opening uh, the invitation, and we're really excited to get staff there. Of course, we have to order furniture, get all of that installed. It's, it's a pretty big undertaking, and we're looking to have the staff um, relocated by May, depending on the lead time of the materials. And I would love to host you all for a tour of our new office once it's ready. Uh, also, budgets. So budget season is starting to creep up and uh, come our way. So of course, we do this in, in tandem with our community redevelopment advisory committees. So we'll start to bring uh, that to the CAC groups in April so we can start to see what the budget uh, priorities for the next fiscal year look like. Uh, that will, of course, come to the board for two hearings uh, starting June, July, and then we'll be set for the fiscal year ahead. Uh, CRP updates, as we heard, we have, we have a few underway. We have uh, the downtown CRP. We just received the first draft, uh, and we're really, really excited about it. They're also working on a project prioritization matrix and scoring calculator, and that is related to uh, what I was saying with filtering the projects through and making sure that they're, they're on point with what we're doing. Um, so we, we have the downtown. We also have Central Park and Tampa Heights. Uh, that, those community redevelopment plans are being updated. They're in the community engagement phase right now. So if you have ideas, it's the time to reach out to us and, and share that. And that's looking to be completed by fall of 2024. And then we are very excited to get the East Tampa uh, Community Redevelopment Plan updated as well. As you know, they completed a strategic action plan, and this is a community redevelopment plan update so we can marry uh, the redevelopment plan with this action plan and, and really make some progress uh, over the next 10 years in East Tampa. The CRA sunsets in 10 years, so of course this we, we want to be really aggressive with our redevelopment efforts. Um, so we're very excited about that. We just selected the contractor this week through the CCNA process. And then um, capacity building. So of course we are still looking for talent and, and people to join our team, but we're also identifying talent from within. And as we start to really establish these departments that I was talking about, um, you, just for the public, it used to be geographic specific and you had a district manager that oversaw all the programs and grants and just had this great responsibility of processing all of that. So now we're more departmental function, which means that our CRA managers can focus on community engagement, serving the public, better communication, and it's really gonna allow them to have the time and capacity to just do effective work with the community. Uh, so part of that is that some of the role has been delegated uh, to those departments. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you know, we have a vacancy in the West Tampa and Drew Park CRA manager role. And we kind of stopped and paused and, and looked at everything and everyone. And um, we have some exciting news, news to announce. So uh, our current CRA managers will, will take on those districts as interims. And uh, Ms. Brenda, Brenda Thrower, who is here, she is serving as the interim EBOR CRA manager. Uh, and doing a great job. And uh, she's willing to take on West Tampa CRA as well uh, through the interim. 
So we have two historic districts, um, and I know Brenda's made a lot happen in, in Ebor, and looking forward to getting some progress uh, in, in West Tampa as well. So we're excited. We're excited about that. And then we also have um, East Tampa CRA manager, Cedric McRae, and uh, he's willing to take on Drew Park. And as you know, this is a very industrial heavy uh, district, and so is East Tampa as well as residential. So there's, there's some common themes, and, and we can see how different communities are operating and functioning uh, and just continue to be their advocates. So I uh, wanted to let the board know that those interims will be taking on the additional districts, and we feel really confident uh, about their ability to do so because uh, some of their job has been um, placed in other departments. So right now we have three managers uh, functioning and, and uh, everything's going smoothly. Um, the last thing that I wanted to mention, um, and I'll pass it out when, when we get them, uh, we had some discussion about the Memorial Park uh, fence fencing. Mm -hmm. I would also like to make the public aware of uh, there is a, a cleanup happening at Memorial Park Cemetery. So if anything that was said today struck a chord within you, um, come out into the community, help us clean up the site, take good care of it. And I'll be announcing that once Mr. McRae brings the flyers. So that will come around later. But there is a cleanup coming in a few Saturdays from now. Um, and that's what it's all about, is working alongside the community. If there's any event um, or anything that we can be a part of, please invite uh, the CRA and our staff, because it's not just about the work. It's about you know, having our hands and feet in the community with you as well. So we look forward to participating in that. I'll pass out a flyer once we have the date and time uh, with us. And just want to thank everyone for, for sharing their comments today and also thank the CRA board for their support. Okay, that's, that's a short director's report. Yes, ma'am. Board member Hertek, then board member Carlson. You want on this end? Um, thank you for your update. Uh, I am. Uh, we had an update earlier this week, and I just wanted to say how excited I am uh, for the managers to take over these spaces. Uh, I was. It was heartening to hear that they have the desire and the interest, and I think that the the aligning just goes so well. I just the historic and the historic and. You know, working on industrial spaces, and now that they don't have to do every single thing, mm -hmm. I think it's a really good way to make sure that they aren't siloed, and I think that's a great idea, so I'm looking forward to working with them. Um, as far as the CRPs go, I, I want to be interviewed for every single one. I can't speak to everyone, but I really enjoy good. that process, so um, I would like to be um, included. Uh, and then the other thing that I'm most impressed by, and we're all, I'm, I'm, still blown away by how far we've gotten um, in this in this reorganization. But I really love the idea of the metrics. And you showed me a brief mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, possibility of what the, that metric design will look like. And I just want to say, I really love the way that the metric focuses on what we all agreed on during our retreat and how we're just, we're, we're laser focused. We're only going to look at the things that we are interested that we have set our priorities and I think that's just absolutely uh, fabulous and it allows us to focus on what we've already agreed on and not having to look at all of the other noise because we get a lot of noise mm -hmm. so get being able to focus on the things that this community and this board has already said that they want I really appreciate that thank you, thank yes, you. board member Carlson yeah I want to echo the thanks to you and Elise and Nicole before you for all the um, all the changes and strategies that you're adding to this process. Um, on the community engagement, I also would like to be included in all of them. I, I in most of these processes, you typically would in, include all the board members. Mm -hmm. So please, um, I think we should do that. Um, but the other thing is, I want to make sure it's it's broad to the community and the community knows about it and they know how to give input to it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, um, could you please send us the um, the community engagement timeline or processes just so mm -hmm. we can be aware of it. Um, for one, if somebody says, well, you all didn't do it, at least we would have the information. Mm -hmm. But um, but also um, so we know where and how much. Um, I just want to make sure it's thorough. <coughs> the typical way government, not necessarily this government, the typical way government does public engagement is they check the box, they hold a charrette, they open, have an open house. They, don't, they half hardly invite people and they don't listen to what they say. Um, I believe in real community engagement, which is where we it, ask questions as broadly as possible and try to get as many ideas as possible. Um, and then we can still put them through our filters, but we have uh, broad ideas from the community. Second, especially since Ms. Loggett is here, um, housing, I've 
continue to get a lot of questions about what the CRA is doing for housing. There's the perception that the city and CRA are doing nothing for housing. The biggest investment in housing in the city is the CRA. And I think we need to communicate it more. I know you're stepping up on the communication side. I would recommend that you, or ask uh, that you put together just a kitchen cabinet ad hoc meeting with Ms. Lockett and a few other housing ag ag advocates and, um, and figure out how to build out this, the housing section on our website so that people know what we're doing and we figure out how to brand it. Um, in places like Ebor, and uh, there are questions all the time about what are the projects? Are they moving forward? Is anything happening? And and nobody really knows what they are. And so, um, you know, I, I'm blame it on me. Three or four years ago, I made the motion, and and my colleagues sur supported it to put 30 percent of the um, CRA money in affordable housing. But in places like Ebor, that was very very unpopular. And I know staff took big hits for that, especially Elise. Um, and, uh, and, and ultimately, the, you know, it's my fault I'm willing to take the blame, but we need to show something for that uh, to those folks because there are other pressing needs that they have in those communities that they want to spend money on. Um, as several of the speakers have said, housing should be our first priority, um, but we need to figure out, it, you know, are we moving fast enough, what's happening? Mm -hmm. And as you and I and, and, and Mr. Massey have discussed, um, we also need to define, carefully define what the role is of the CRA. Um, if it, the, the CRA does not have a housing department, um, also if we buy assets, they end up be, being owned by the city. And, so, and you can't do everything. You can't have scope creep where you're expected to manage the entire process. I know in your last job, you did manage the entire process on affordable housing, but that cannot be a, a, um, a task of the CRA. We've got to carefully define, even though we're kind of part of the same organization, we're separate and we have limited resources for staff, we have to define what the unique role is of the of the CRA in different projects, in particular housing. And I'll talk about that when we get to Tampa Union Station. But one thing is to clarify more formally with contracts. When we when we form a, a, a grant agreement with an, a third party like CDC or Tampa Theater, whatever, we have very detailed contracts with them. But we're looser with the way we hand money over to the city. And I think um, not necessarily for legal reasons, but just to make sure that we that we are very careful about explaining roles. We want to collaborate. Everybody wants to work together. We, the CRA must collaborate with the city. But we need to define what are the roles of the CRA staff because you only have 24 hours in the day. You, we can't find two more hours for you. And the same thing with the other staff who are now taking on more than one district. So what is the unique role? Are we project managers? Are we just holding um, the city or whatever organization accountable to the, to the CRA laws? What, what specifically is the role there? Um, and then, and then I'll come back in new business and talk a little bit about the um, the agreement we have with the with the um, CR with the between the CRA and the city. Um, I helped rewrite some of it four or five years ago, and there's some little things that we need to tweak that we that we never finished. I've had long conversations with Morris and others about that too. Last thing is the Jackson House, and um, we've been trying to fund the Jackson House for two or three years. And there were obstacles after obstacles put forward. Uh, back in August, uh, we took away the last obstacle, and the Jackson House Foundation was here. And, and I asked from, from the dais, would they be OK updating us? I think it was in November. Mm -hmm. They canceled in November. They canceled in December. They canceled in January. I think the feeling in the community is that the Jackson House Foundation either doesn't have the capacity or, or, or whatever is not moving forward. We've got to figure out. We've, we've allocated a million dollars. And if we need to put in more, we can. But we need to um, figure out how to move that forward. We have another storm season coming. Nobody expects it to last, even though it's lasted forever. And uh, we know USF and the Tampa Bay History Center have been partnering with Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, maybe in new business, I'll make a motion regarding the Jackson House. But we've got to come to a solution, because um, otherwise, it's just going to fall apart. Um, and it is a community asset that needs to be protected. I think we have a duty to protect the community asset, even though a foundation may own it. Quickly, relative to the Jackson House issue, I believe there's a presentation coming to you sitting at City Council at your next regular meeting mm -hmm. yes. regarding the Jackson House. Yes. And so maybe after that meeting, whether further CRA involvement is necessary, that could be a discussion point after that. that yes. was, no. Okay. Um, and I, you have something else you just, want to say? Just one more sure. thing. Sure, board member. Or I just wanted to respond to board member Carlson and just say, I do think that we, 
at the end of this month, we'll get more of a cohesive understanding of what we're trying to do with housing. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. I think that's going to be our roadmap forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just have one comment, um, Director Moody, I, and I looked at my own notes after our staff meeting. Mm -hmm. Can you give me the status of the RFP for CRA communication? I haven't heard about that mm -hmm. lately. Where are we in that process? Um, yeah. Because it's for all CRAs, and it was included in the budget, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, So what's the status of that? So we have the request for proposals drafted, and uh, it's just currently under review and with purchasing and needs needs to just be put out to the public. I've agreed with the communications coordinator that the key deliverable right now is the annual report. So we're wanting to get that underway, and then the very next one is putting out the RFP for marketing services. Okay, so March the, the March state report is the priority, and then mm -hmm. the RFP for communication. What? Yes, ma'am. What position is it in now? You said it's in what office? It's So the communications coordinator for the CRA is overseeing the contract, and it goes through several reviews. Once we draft it, we send it to purchasing. They do the due diligence on that, give us the green light, and then that's when we post it. Um, we're expecting to post it beginning of April once we have the report complete. Okay, thank you. All right. Anyone else? Let's move on. Let's see. It well, is thank you so much. I do have um, the flyers that I'll pass out. And just for the public, there is the Friends of Belmont Heights Memorial Park Cemetery. Um, it's the cleanup event. It's on Saturday, February 17th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Oh, on the projector. And this is it for those who would like to take a screenshot. And I have extra copies. Thank you so much. So that is the conclusion of the director's report. Hope to see you guys on the 17th of February. And we'll start to move into the wayfinding presentation um, and transition that. Thank you. OK, it is 10.22. Mm -hmm. Well, Union Station might take a minute, but let's move. Great. Um, no, thank you. And presentation mode. Oh You'll just need to do it from here. Okay. I'm just going to introduce yourself. John. Good morning again. Good Courtney morning. Gore, Urban Core Development Manager. I'm going to give you a little present or little background before the presentation of the wayfinding signage study that's been underway for a few months. We hired Architecture Plus International. Uh, they were contracted to develop a comprehensive wayfinding and signage study for Central Park, Channel District, Tampa Heights, and the um, downtown core. So they have, the objective of the study was to identify visitor destinations within and adjacent to these CRA districts and provide recommendations to both facilitate and improve pedestrian, multimodal, and vehicular wayfinding. The project was developed in three, three phases. Phase one, discovery and analysis. Phase two, programming. And phase three, concept design. John Shuffle is the individual who is here with API today to present to you more information on the phases that were uh, accomplished. And I will introduce him now to run through a presentation we have loaded up on the screen. Here. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, my name is John Shuffle with API, and it's an honor to be here today with uh, board members. I've been asked by staff to uh, essentially focus on the phase three, which is concept design. I would like to give you a little bit of background on the first two phases um, and just to things that, that relate to, to why we ended up coming up with the designs that we came up with. As Courtney mentioned, it was a three-phase project, the first being the analysis and discovery, uh, the second was programming, and the third being concept design. We had certain objectives and goals in mind, uh, several of them, but just a couple that we wanted to highlight is that we wanted this wayfinding program to focus on vehicular, uh, pedestrian, and other modes of transportation with emphasis, emphasis being on the 
pedestrian traffic. We wanted to encourage visitors to park their cars and explore the city by foot. And we wanted to make this program really distinguish between one neighborhood or district um, to another. In the analysis phase, we did a comprehensive study. Um, what, what I'm flipping through very quickly here is just the summary of what we did, but we analyzed um, all the components of the existing program as well as the circulation throughout downtown. Um, we looked at functionality and design. We looked at the condition of the signs. Um, we looked at sign clutter. Uh, we looked at the navigational system and as, as, with regards to how you get to the parking garages and how they're identified. Uh, we looked at pedestrian signs. Uh, one of our, our takeaways from this is that the pedestrian directionals are very high up in the air. It's, it's small copy. You know, a recommendation that we made is to do something that's, that's lower to the ground. It's more of a monolith um, that's going to be pedestrian friendly. And then we looked at other micro abilities such as bikes, scooters, and other modes of transportation. Uh, we came up with, at the conclusion of this phase, we came up with a list of recommendations, and I'm going to hit through those. But one of the key discoveries was that in a traditional uh, city or wayfinding navigation system, you direct first to, the, to downtown, then you direct to a district, then you direct to the destination, and it's always important to try to get the visitor past the front door of the destination, and then you direct them to parking. Uh, St. Petersburg, uh, that's more traditional. There are two main public parking garages, and so, so um, for that program, we directed people to destinations and into the parking garages. Tampa uh, has an abundance of, of uh, city-owned public parking garages and lots, and so the strategy here is a little different. And so instead, we're directing to downtown and then the neighborhoods or districts, and then from there, directing to the parking garages, and then from the parking garages or lots, we would then direct by foot or other micro abilities to the various destinations. And this shift in strategy makes the parking garages, uh, the, pub, the city owned public, or city -owned public uh, parking garages, much more important and critical in this wayfinding component. So as part of the recommendations, uh, we wanted to consider placemaking place along with wayfinding. And in conjunction with that, uh, placemaking is really creating a sense of place and, and uh, celebrating where you are. So we really want to emphasize the districts and neighborhoods of the of various uh, parts of downtown and really call them out on the signage. We think it's critical that because of this change in strategy that the parking, uh, which is not a, currently a part of this, this scope of work, that parking is, should definitely be an integral part of it, as well as gateway signage. We also felt that, um, as I mentioned earlier, that there needs to be a greater emphasis on pedestrian signs, and it's especially with this change in strategy. Another thing that, that came forward is that the current program that's, that's in place, um, a lot of the locations of the signs, especially the vehicular directionals, are in the spots that they need to be. It's just the signs really need to be updated. So the, when you, we were also looked at budget pricing. So when you look at, say, a uh, post and panel sign, half the cost of the sign is actually in the post and the foundation. So if we can reuse some of the existing foundations and posts that are out there, that will allow us to spread our money further and do more signs. And so the, the problem with that is that uh, FDOT has changed the code twice since those signs were installed in 2006. So we'll need to work with a fabricator to see we, we have to stay within certain sizes in order to maintain those foundations. So it's something that we're going to keep in mind as we move this forward. In the programming phase, we looked at uh, developing destination criteria. Uh, we came up with a list of destinations that would be listed on vehicular signs as well as uh, pedestrian signs. We studied layouts and uh, you know, some of our, our destination names are long, so we, we, we did a thorough study of that and got the committee's approval. And throughout this process, we met a lot with uh, the committee that was formed 
as well as we met with the mobility department numerous times, uh, Tampa Downtown Partnership, FIA, um, various organizations just to understand a lot of the changes that are happening downtown like with Ashley Drive. So again, I'm just gonna flip through this quickly, but if at the end, if there are any, any items that you wanna go through in detail, um, we can come back to this. Uh, we looked at key circulations uh, into downtown and secondary circulations, as well as circulation throughout downtown. We developed a vehicular navigation strategy and then uh, took, developed some prototypical messages for some of those key destination uh, or decision points. We also looked at the pedestrian pathways from each of the five um, main uh, city-owned public parking garages. And with each one, we developed uh, prototypical pedestrian messages. <coughs> we also looked then at um, the Riverwalk signage. Um, that, that's another group that we talked with, the Friends of the Riverwalk. And with mobility and the Tampa Downtown Partnership, we developed uh, mobility hubs uh, for micro mobilities for bikes and scooters. And then we did a complete inventory of the existing signage that's out there, including the Riverwalk signage. So for the concept design, uh, we came up with several concepts and with the committee and with through various discussions, we narrowed it down to three concepts. Um, with each one, we, there is a primary part of the sign that would be consistent throughout all of downtown, all of the CRAs, and then there's a component that would change based on the neighborhood or district that you're in. So keep that in mind as you're looking through the concepts. Um, we also wanted to have some variety in the three options that we're showing you um, where maybe the district is, is downplayed or, or upplayed and the use of color and pattern. Um, these are all, the colors are also uh, conceptual that you'll see. So there, we anticipate there could be some mixing and matching of concepts. The first concept is uh, more historical in nature, um, in its form. It's a bit celebratory with the, with the arched cap on top. Um, this, what we're showing for each of these is one prototypical uh, district, which is the River Arch District. Um, we call it out, uh, this first sign that you see is what we call a uh, destination, or, or I'm sorry, district identity sign. So once you arrive to the district, it identifies the district. Um, it also can be reinforced throughout the district. And then the second one you see is the vehicular directional signs. The blue portion is what would change, or, or what would be consistent from neighborhood to neighborhood, and then the yellow portion is what would change. And on this concept, the back side of the sign incorporates a T pattern. Um, I'm not sure if I can zoom in, but but it's a T pattern for Tampa. And then the the yeah, third group of signs would be what would be utilized for maybe a bike path. And then for the pedestrian signs, that's more the monolithic type that brings it down closer to the ground. And this would allow us to utilize the existing footers for those signs. Concept two is a bit more modern in nature and it takes its design cues from the electronic Ike signs that are out there now so that they start to feel more integrated with the program. Um, this also starts to introduce a unique pattern that would be um, unique for each of the, of the various neighborhoods. This one also has, um, in this concept, it downplays the name of the district, but that could certainly be increased in size. And in concept three, is, is a, it's a bit lighter and breezier. Um, it takes its cues from the Riverwalk. This one is also uh, Tampa Proud, where it has Tampa listed on all the signs, but more in a tone-on-tone -tone way, uh, but still also includes the district identity. And then as part of our process, we also looked at uh, budgeting and developing budget numbers for the vehicular and pedestrian signage uh, throughout downtown. So I think with that, Courtney, do you want to? 
I believe the goal now is to get some input from you on the concept design. I like the first one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's really what our aim is, is to get an understanding from all of you as a body of what your preferences are in regard to the three designs John's presented to you. Not color, just the design of the, of the actual signage. Board member Clint Dennis. Good morning. <clears throat> Every, the, uh, the engineering and the, and the scope of the project seems to be um, well thought out. I'm curious, is there, what is the applicability of this now with everybody having GPS in their pocket? Is it still something that's, I mean, did you guys discuss that or weigh this out? Yes, yeah, yeah. So and that was part of our analysis. Um, you know, we, we talked about the principles of wayfinding. So yes, a lot of people do utilize GPS to get to where they're going. But one of the key assets of a wayfinding program um, is the marketability of it. So, so if somebody's walking around downtown and they look up and they see that there's a firefighters museum um, on the sign and they may not know that there's a firefighters museum in Tampa. Okay, so point. it helps promote the assets of downtown. Yeah. And some people are not looking at GPS, they are looking at the signs. Do we have the ability to sell space? Let's say the addition wants to put a sign, you know, are we able to be commercialize this at all? One, one of the, uh, the requests at the beginning was to have some sort of revenue generating component as part of the system. I believe that there is a place for that in the parking garages as well as uh, possibly with, um, if we incorporate wrapping the electrical boxes, uh, the traffic light electrical boxes. Okay. But, but not on, I, I definitely would not recommend that for the vehicular wayfinding signs. Um, there could be a component of the pedestrian signs that we do, mm -hmm. but that's where the, the Ike signs do have the ability to, to sell advertising. So that's, that's why we developed that concept too, to kind of tie into the Ike signs. I'm, I'm going to pull out my uh, my uh, gay card and veto with the color schemes on all of these. So uh, it's, <laughs> that's absolutely completely unacceptable. Um, but the uh, also, I mean, obviously, I, I, I love the fact. <laughs> did I kill you on that one? You can pull out your black card anytime you want, but I can't pull out my gay card. <laughs> Stay focused. <laughs> I'm fo back to being focused. Um, the uh, I like the idea because you had it in the concept of Tampa, you know, making it recognizable Tampa and marketing Tampa. I don't really, I mean, I, 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 I see a tip to it a little bit in this first concept, but I, I think I, I would like to be able to revisit that idea a little bit more of that it is something distinctively Tampa. So that when you, when somebody, if there, if there is a B roll or something rolling and somebody even doesn't read that sign, but they can see that sign, they know that's Tampa. You know, I, and so maybe there's something that you could do that really makes this very, very distinctively recognizable as a Tampa asset, as this, and because you talked about, you know, the um, the marketing of this as well, and you know the people. So I think that's a it's a lot of real estate we're going to distribute around the city. I, lo I like say I, I like the way you've done it. I like the way you did it with the parking garages and how you yeah. the neighborhoods. I think that's wonderful. But somehow, if we can make this very distinctively Tampa, I think it would be a, a big improvement. Board Member Hertek and Maniscalco. Thanks. Thank you. Um, first, I'm going to see if uh, um, if the comms folks can take off the Microsoft Edge thing because I couldn't see some of the presentation. So just like if there's a way. Anyway, um, so uh, I appreciate the, the time that went into this. I also uh, prefer the first one, although I don't particularly care. All I want is that the Steelers stars not be on them. Um, and I, I'm just going to say that. I don't think that's wise for the city to, to use um, the, the um, stars from the Pittsburgh Steelers on its. Um, I, I'm just saying. Uh, I just think we should avoid that, considering that we have such a team that we all love so much. and. Um, uh, I, while I think the parking garage is a great idea, I do not come downtown in my car if I'm not working. I come down on the bus, I come down on my bike, people come from the streetcar. So I'm looking for, like the streetcar ends at Franklin. We need, we need that's where I would put the signage. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, uh, we have bikeways now that we're encouraging. So mm -hmm. I wanna make sure that you're focused on that. Uh, 
I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about bike parking because I can. Bike parking in this city is really bad and it's cutesy. We need simple U-shaped bike bike parking. Um, anything else is really difficult for someone to lock a bike to. Um, so I just want to say that uh, that while this is great for people who are parking, I think there needs to be additions for cyclists on the pro proposed bike paths or bike paths that already exist. Um, you know, bus stops, close things, and make sure that it's it's um, convenient and again for the streetcar. Thank you, Maniscalco. Uh, can we go to two real quick and then to three, and then three? I remember I, I got a presentation a couple of days ago, and I'm debating between two and three. Mm -hmm. I think three is uh, the most interesting to me because of the shape, even though it's just a simple shape. You know, to make something distinctly Tampa, I would say it's a, in the shape of a cigar or a Cuban sandwich. I mean, like, you know, what's, <laughs> I'm trying to think, like, what do we do? But um, that's why people pay the big bucks. The big bucks. But I think, you know, just, it's going to cost more money to to customize it to a specific shape. I mean, I think three stands out. It's not just a rectangular shape or a square shape. It's something a little bit different. The colors, I know we, we worry about those later, and the stars and all that stuff. Um, I don't know. I, I would say three. Three is my my choice. A board member, Miranda. Numero uno. Thank you. Yeah. Plain and simple. Oh, I was going to say, chime in, board member Carlson. Time in Riera. Same one, Carl. Yeah, I, I, I was involved in this program in St. Pete a long, long time ago, and um, and then I, I, I was aware of the programs in the last two programs in Tampa. I'm going to stay out of the design uh, part of it, but um, uh, the, the the one that we had, I think this one, this version we have now is like 20 years old or something like that, uh, 25 years old. 2009. Mm -hmm. Is it that only that new? But yes. it's um, it is uh, one of the things I find about it is that it the, the the type is way too small. The one before that maybe it was too big, uh, but it, I think the type is too small. Um, and and when I was younger, people who were older said they had a hard time reading, but um, but still, when you're driving fast, it's hard it's hard to see. It looks to me like these are bigger than the existing ones. Um, but I, I'm concerned about people's ability to read it. Um, people do get confused in downtown, and, and even though we're trying to get them to go to the parking garage as quickly as possible, they, uh, they, they need to read it from the car also. Um, the other thing is that I know um, Sean Drinker has been working with the Downtown Partnership to brand each of the seven neighborhoods around downtown, and I think that's a great idea. Um, it's something you know St. Pete did, other cities have done just like we brand our other neighborhoods throughout the city, and it will help bring the distinctive style and form to each of the neighborhoods. And I would be in favor of even branding those neighborhoods more. Maybe you have a common element that shows that it's still Tampa, but but branding them more. Same thing with the neighborhood signs like the one that was shown this morning. Those are like 20 years old and they're really boring looking, um, and they don't have anything that's distinctive about neighborhoods. Um, so somehow I think we, we need to do the sub-branding there. Um, how much do you, are you about to get the budget, or you did that already? How much is the total cost of this? The, <laughs> this was, um, without the Riverwalk signage, was about uh, $1.2 million for the and, vehicular pedestrian and the bike signage, because um, the bike, bike re signage was part of this. And just for the record, because somebody in the community will ask, could Eric or somebody explain why? Uh, this is funded by CRA instead of the city. You know, one of the piece of feedback we get from the public is that we sh that we should not be supplementing something the city would otherwise pay. Could you just explain quickly why why the city isn't funding this and why it's necessary for CRA funds to be used? Absolutely, Eric Moody, CRA director. Um, and the CRA is really to go above and beyond, and, th and that's where we wanted to bring in the, the color signage and the creative placemaking, so that's why it has some design with it, as well as um, specific district branding. So as you move through, the colors will change, so it's really a wayfinding effort, but also a creative placemaking and branding effort as well. Um, as you heard, the signs were installed in 2009, but they're misplaced, the location, so that was part of this comprehensive study, is to see you know where the vehicles will identify pedestrians, bicyclists, 
cyclist and more of a holistic approach to to wayfinding downtown and mm -hmm. then that's why we got innovative with the colors and and different um, graphics and designs okay all right um, Board Member Vieira. I, I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, I, I, I have no preference between. I mean, I, may I see two again, if, if I may, if, if we're taking a vote? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, and may I see one, if I may? You like one. Oh, one? Yes, sir. Thanks. You know what? You do like I mean, part of me says I'm down for whatever on this, but, but I'll, if I had to go, I'd go with one. I think that three is a little out there and, and one seems the most traditionalist so but but again I have no strong preference on this but yeah in closing remarks I would just like to say I, I like the arch of um, one which I think kind of represents downtown and Ybor City and our just our city and also the stars should be eliminated we do have a sign um, I don't know if it belongs to visit Tampa Bay it has like the anchor um, is that a visit Tampa Bay sign? Well, maybe they should let us use it or they can help us pay for it. I don't know. But that definitely, I wear, I have it on my hat. It's a pin that they use. Um, it definitely, when I look at that pin, I know that that is Tampa without any verbiage. So, you know, an anchor, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. It already exists. Maybe we can partner with them. Um, because it is for tourism as well, visit Tampa Bay, that, that, that logo might work so Santiago if you're listening um, he's not listening <laughs> well anyway maybe you all can strike up a conversation with him it's just a suggestion but it definitely it, it already exists so don't reinvent the wheel and stars are definitely um, you know not the symbol that represents Tampa so you might as well use something that we already have okay thank you so much for this report thank you yeah thank you so much moving on did I still something Let's see. Where are we? 1046. Number four. 1046. I'm just keeping the time of how long it takes us to do each one. <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to make it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, right now. All right. Time for item four. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would like to request that item four and five be heard together since they're both related to the Tampa Union Station. And um, just highlight some people that we have in the room that are part of the Tampa Union Station project. So I believe we have um, Director of Contract Administration, um, Richard Mutterback in the room. We have the Project Manager over Contract Administration in the room, uh, Jeffrey Wilson. And then we also have some uh, representatives that are available from the Facilities Department. Okay. Um, I will provide an update, and then if we have questions, we can field them with, with the team that's here as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So there's, there's two motions. I'll speak to the first one, which is the Tampa Union Station update, and just highlight um, where the project started and, and where it's at now. So on January 19th of 2023, the Tampa City Council passed resolution number 2023-77, which was an agreement for the design, build, initial services between the City of Tampa and Collage Design and Construction Group. Uh, the contractor Collage was selected through the CCNA competitive process, which the response number was RFQ 22-C-00038. Uh, the RFQ outlined the work and um, a time frame that would, it would occur. Additionally, there was a CRA resolution 2022-11 that approved the building improvement um, in the amount of $2.58 million, which is the current CRA commitment uh, to the project. The construction work to take place are treating the termites uh, and having you know, a temporary office trailer and restroom trailer, the design and engineering of the improvements, windows and doors replacement, including the stained glass doors, restroom renovation and repair, uh, lead asbestos abate abatement, <clears throat> roof and decking repairs to the north side of the train platform, interior plaster repair and painting, electrical updates, an Amtrak portable office space, uh, more portable uh, restrooms during the renovation, uh, and pressure washing of the building. So these needs were presented to council on March 2nd, 2022, uh, and the memo in that approval uh, said that the work will be completed late 2024 or early 2025. 
Uh, so the project does remain uh, on that target, but has some, some factors that are influencing it. Uh, one of them has been the design build plans. Uh, they start at zero and they move towards 100. So once you're at 50, 60% of design plans is when you can really start getting some accurate estimates. Uh, so when we got the 60% design plans, we got a more accurate updated estimate, and that's where we realized that there was a funding gap. Uh, that funding gap is about 1.5, a little less than, and that's why the project has been on stop, uh, because there has been a funding gap, and um, I know they've been looking for grants and different ways to secure the funding, but that's why uh, they're here today to request the 1.5 that's needed to continue the construction portion of this project uh, and get it back on track. Uh, they expect to have the 90% plans complete by March 24th, 2024, so we can uh, provide an update at that time once we have the 90% done next month. And then moving towards 100% design and the GMP uh, for May 2024. So we have some, some deadlines there that we can, we can hold to. There's attachments in the memorandum that outline all of this. Uh, we mentioned the funding gap. Uh, and then also the other factor is just the material lead time. Of course, these projects are getting more expensive with inflation, uh, but also the, the lead time on materials, so doors and windows and just the supply chain. Um, those are factors outside of the control uh, that we're just watching closely so we can update the timelines as we have more concrete dates around that. <clears throat> uh, additionally, there, there has been discussion around the uh, co-workspace and the coffee shop. So for the co-workspace, uh, this would be need some additional infrastructure around like cabling and, and um, I used to work in IT, but Cat5 uh, drop-in. So, so, you know, the office place is set up to just be able to drop in and, and remote work. Uh, so that would be an additional uh, scope that we would need to create as far as the improvements to make the building uh, ready for co-working space. And then separately, the coffee shop uh, would require an RFQ. So this would be similar to the Tampa Convention Center um, food provider, where it doesn't require a real cooking facility, uh, such as hoods and grease traps and some of the more comprehensive restaurant uh, items that you need, but it would be a RFP for a portable food vendor. Uh, so that is currently um, would need to be scoped out and funded in addition to the construction repairs that are coming forward today. So that is uh, the status of the project, and I'll open it up for questions. And then we also have a part two around the contract agreement. Board Member Maniscalco and then Carlson. Thank you very much. First, uh, you know, there's a, there's a few th uh, people that need, uh, that, that should be recognized. Uh, first, Mayor Greco and even Council Member Miranda, because this, this came about, uh, the restoration back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe it was during that time that you know, restoration and renovations were done where it was reopened. Uh, but also Councilmember Carlson for being a champion on this. Mm -hmm. um, somebody had mentioned earlier, uh, they showed a photo of one of the rooms in there and the current state of the ceiling. Mm -hmm. And having, you know, when I, when I was involved with Than and, and gone to meetings back in the day, they would meet there sometimes. And the room never looked like that. And it wasn't that long ago. So, you know, time is of the essence because historic buildings, the tropical climate that we have, uh, the, the constant maintenance on historic buildings, you know, this building needs it. Um, I saw the building in all its splendor last March when the Urban League held their ga uh, gala there, mm. and they decorated it and had a party that was, was amazing. And it showed the potential of the building. I mean, mm -hmm. the potential is there, we know, but like activating that space, it was awesome. I mean, mm -hmm. it was black tie. It was top notch. Nice. And um, again, it's a very uh, important building. If you look at the surrounding area, uh, there were buildings across the street. There was another hotel that was demolished about 10, 15 years ago. It was used in the Punisher movie. Mm -hmm. But I remember mm -hmm. that it was, um, so if you want to see what it was like, you can see what was there. And I remember driving up and down Nebraska seeing it. That building is gone. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the Jackson House. We mentioned it earlier, and we have a, a presentation next Thursday. That's across, across the street. But this train station is so significant because people that came to Tampa, whether it was white or black, you know, there were certain areas that were segregated. So you go people at the Jackson That's House right. and then people at the, I believe it was like the Union Hotel, the one that I'm talking about that was demolished. But the um, uh, number of soldiers, World War One, World War II, we're talking about a, a World War Memorial here, mm -hmm. that left in that station that never came back, you mm -hmm. know, or did come back after serving their country. So, I mean, there's so many stories. Um, but the importance of that building, considering it's one of the few 
uh, remaining uh, historic structures, but also we've lost so much of the history. You know, we, right. we see what Encore is like and Central Park and everything. That's gone. Central Avenue is gone, but that mm -hmm. train station, everybody went through that train station. Mm -hmm. So it's very important, and I'm always happy to support funding that will go to continued restoration and renovations. Um, so I appreciate this, and, and I'm always going to be a champion for it. Thank you. Board Member Carlson. Thank you. Yeah, first let me say, um, Tampa Union Station is an important historic building in our community. It, it, there was a lot of history created there. It's a beautiful building. A lot of people worked hard in the 90s to save it, um, including volunteers. Um, this is not my project, and it's not a, a legacy project for me. It's not something I'm trying to push so I can put it in a TV ad at some point. It's just I think it's the right thing to do that we that we need to do this. Um, the, the decision about moving forward should be based on doing what's right and not on politics. Um, my disappointment with this is that we started discussing this back in 2020, so four years ago, and then uh, we approved the 1.5 million in 2022, and then um, and then I found out months or a year later that not from the city but from other sources that that it was not moving forward, and I asked why, and I found out again third party sources that it was not moving forward because the city didn't have enough money and the city was looking for grants, and I said. Well, why don't we city CRA front the money and then that the city mm -hmm. gets grants and they can reimburse us but it was put on hold for months without moving forward with it, even though it's getting water damage and termite damage because there was no money nobody ever asked us to to up the money so we voluntarily increased the money a year and a half or so ago and then still nothing has been done and so the request for 1.5 million didn't come from the city it came again because through third parties, I found out the city again, because the price had gone up, the city was waiting on grants again. And, and I understand that from a fiscal point of view because we don't have much money, mm -hmm. but we do have money in the CRA and we allocated it and the public wants this, this building done. So again, um, I have a motion I've been working on with Morris. I can make it when everybody's done talking, but I think that we, we need to add this money on. I just wish the city was more forthcoming and telling us what they needed and it, we can't delay uh, repairing this building the county just put in a lot of money to renovate the baggage claim area and it's already being eaten by termites uh, the thing this asset is being damaged it's going to cost us more and more not because of inflation not just because of inflation but because of um, of the additional damage that's being done and I think we need we need to get in triage this right away if the city doesn't want to do this then tell us, tell the public it's not a party and we'll spend the money somewhere else. But while this money is tied up, we need to move forward because the cost keeps going up. It's gone up, uh, originally it was 1.5 million, now it's gonna be like 4 million. And um, I'm, I'm glad we have new staff like Mr. Murderback and I'm certain that he and others will manage this process correctly. I would just ask the administration to make sure that we, that we move forward. And what I had said before, the reason for number five is if this was, all the other city buildings that we funded are run by nonprofits. And if any of them, like Tampa Theater, Straz, whatever, if they had so many delays and so many cost overruns like this, we would have we would have had front page stories about why they weren't keeping their promises to the city. In this case, it's the CRA funding the city. And that's why I think we need to formalize our agreements with the city from now on. Mr. Massey in his email to us said that once a contract is is made, we cannot have contingencies that cancel that contract. But there are other kinds of requirements, like uh, we don't have to fund the city until um, until the the RFP is signed or until the till the work starts. Uh, we also could require in a contract that 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 a separate project or uh, would be that we would treat it for termites and water damage immediately to protect it. Um, the other thing <clears throat> is that. I'm disappointed that now we're suddenly having a discussion about how the incubator is going to cost more money and be a separate RFP. We started talking about that in 2020, and I know you're new, so I'm not talking. But but why is that suddenly a surprise to everybody when we've been? It's there are media reports about it. We discuss it openly here, and uh, and we put the money in in part to do that. So if the city has requirements on how to do that, come let us know. But but everybody bought into the idea that it would not only be a train station, but that it would also be activated as a, as a co-work space uh, to promote entrepreneurship. It's the, it's the middle point between Channel District and what's happening in Ybor. Mm -hmm. It's an important building 
um, we also need to protect the Amtrak service that's coming up for renewal. One of the things yeah. I think that we have to bifurcate the 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 RIP and infrastructure for a co work space with some structural things that are happening. The mm -hmm. Amtrak wall is a big facade. They don't need that entire wall. They don't even need all the office space upstairs. Their lease is running out, I think, in August. April. We can, we can, huh? April. We could go ahead and start moving August. their window all the way to the right, take down the false facade as part of the basic infrastructure that opens up the back offices and upstairs and, and just have them lease whatever it is they need. All of, all of that is a structural thing. If we need to add additional tables or, or um, uh, wiring and things for a for a co work space, that's different. But first, we need to make sure that we allow the space to open up. It's not just the main area; it's the upstairs parts on the right side and the left side mm -hmm. that need to be open. The other part of the of the motion two three years ago was a statue, uh, a, a World War II memorial, and. Um, and, and I understand that that's been on hold the whole two years. It hasn't moved forward. It was a separate motion. And the reason apparently it's been put on hold is because the, the construction has been put on hold. If you build a statue through consensus with the World War II committee we've been talking about, you can put it in a warehouse and you can talk about it and then you can move it in when it makes sense. But it doesn't have to be on hold. It can be done concurrently. Um, so anyway, when everybody's done commenting, I have a motion uh, to try to move this forward again. Thank you. Board member Herte. Oh, okay. Oh, you have a question? Or actually, just a statement for other folks. Could you explain to people, like, because when I, you know, when I read about that we're not uh, termite or treating for termites until July 1st, and we've got window leaks and there's water intrusion, and I saw the pictures of the condition of the ceiling that this isn't going to be completed until January 1st. What in the heck takes so long? If your house was falling apart, you would you would expedite getting your house treated for termites. You'd, if you had water come into your roof, you'd get some emergency repairs. How in the world has the city allowed this to, to happen? And, and, and how is, what has happened with the city that we've allowed this property to deteriorate like this? Thank you for your question. Let me lean on the experts. Um, would anyone like to take that question on? Yeah, oh, okay. Um, is Adri available to speak yeah, on that? Yeah, she is. Yeah. Okay. I am. Good morning. Adrian Colina, Director of Logistics and Asset Management. Uh, I completely agree with all of you on the importance of that building. And I do remember walking on site with Councilman Carlson, uh, looking through it all. We, the LAM facilities team, identified the immediate needs of the building. And that included termite treatment, window restoration or replacement, uh, asbestos, a number of other things. We actually have an agreement in place. We entered into, we went through the competitive bid process. We have an agreement in place with Collage Group and it has never been put on hold. And I'm sorry that there may have been some misinformation out there. Council approved the agreement with the Collage Group in January of 23. In February, they were issued a notice to proceed. We have been working with them the whole time. The issue with, uh, the tent for the termites right now, keep in mind, we have to work logistically with Amtrak because it is still a functioning station. Uh, CSX did some work to the rails and that kind of set us back some. They did some rail replacement and we have been working with Amtrak. We've been working with historic preservation. Keep in mind, it's a historic building. We have flown in window and uh, window experts to look to see how we can renovate it there's specialized wood around the framing of the windows. Um, it, there's a lot of components. I tell you all of this, which is probably more detailed than you care to have. But just to assure you, a lot of work has been taking place. We have not stopped. Uh, we are on track. We did send you a memo in March of 2022 that said we expected it to be completed by the end of this year, beginning of next. Again, with the work that CSX did, we are a little behind on that, but we are looking to have the project completed May of 2025, assuming we have all the funds in place. And so that's where we are. Uh, but I can't assure you enough, we've been committed to that project and we have been working on it. And to a layperson, it may seem like we're taking long, but it's a historic building. It needs a lot of work. And we are working to do as much as we can in a little amount of time to minimize the disruption to Amtrak. Okay, board member Clinton. So, th and thank you for your memo, by the way. Um, so, what are we doing? 
to expedite the termite treatment to ex and and to like so again I understand what we're doing as far as like the long term replacement of windows for the, for the renovations building but short term short term mitigation features to continue to stop water damage to the building are we doing anything proactive on that so water is not currently intruding we are okay right now we are monitoring it we have the collage team on site we have been looking at all of it so I can assure you, we are not doing anything that would further damage. Like any kind of delay that we're talking about is not causing any further damage. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. Thank you for your question. Okay. Well, I actually love that building. Um, I actually did attend that Urban League Gala there. It's a great um, event space for us and historical in nature. Um, the um, tour that I went on, I, I remember there was a conversation they had just discovered that they did not receive a grant mm -hmm. uh, that they were hoping to get. And I know their disappointment in that. So there has been these efforts and attempts to get funding. And if we have an opportunity to um, course correct and get this project moving, then I can support that. Board member Carlson wants to make a motion. Thank you. Um, Board member, I mean, do you have something to say, Attorney Massey? <laughs> um, I was going to give a copy of the motion to the clerk, but, oh, okay. but quickly, I did want to clarify for the boards uh, and the public's uh, education. There is an agreement in place mm -hmm. between the city and the right. CRA for this. And a, a reminder to city staff, and I think we, I should, we probably need to have the CRA secretary and CRA staff to, to monitor this, but the agreement does require that the city provide quarterly updates. And so we need to do a better job about that. I think that then this funding deficit and these issues would have come to the Absolutely. fore earlier. Mm -hmm. So we need to we need to start making sure that's a regular part of what we do here Absolutely. and it's on the calendar. Um, the agreement also does provide that if grants are received for the restoration of Camp Union Station, then the CRA grant would be reduced by that amount that mm -hmm. is received. So those things are already addressed in the contract. And I think what the motion is going to propose is an amendment to that that would provide up to an additional 1.5 million, but only effective upon mm -hmm. the actual construction contract coming to city council and being approved by council. Okay. So. Board member Carlson, make your motion. Yeah, and thank you to Mr. Massey and also and uh, Ms. Kalina. Um, the uh, the Friends of Tampa Union Station, which saved it back in the in the mid 90s, um, they have had many meetings with staff recently, and they tell me they're very comfortable that staff is committed to this project, and so I. Um, Whatever happened in the past, I appreciate everybody's commitment to move this forward now. Mm -hmm. um, so I move that the current grant funding between the city and CRA be amended to provide up to an additional 1.5 million from the downtown CRA over the uh, 2.58 million already committed for the restoration, repair, and renovation of Tampa Union Station with such an amendment becoming effective upon city council's approval of the agreement for construction services for that work between the city and the selected design build firm. I request that this amendment be presented to the CRA board for approval at the next CRA regular meeting on March 21st, 2024. We have a motion by board member Carlson, second by board member Hertek. Any discussion? Board member Beer. Yeah, and, and I'll again support this. I think this is wonderful. Um, something I talked about before when Councilman Carlson uh, first brought this up some time ago is um, uh, also, um, as he mentioned today, making this uh, a potential workspace for a lot of the attorneys who and, and staff and others who do work at the George Edgecombe, uh, George Edgecombe Courthouse uh, nearby. I, it's, a, it's a great link, and when, God willing, the Jackson House uh, gets up and restored, I think that would be uh, just, it, it, it could make a real impact. Um, and I also do want to comment on this because I, I, I've also commented on past um, downtown CRA uh, investments, right? Because we're talking about capping the downtown CRA. And whenever you spend funds, whether it's on something, and everything we've spent funds on is, is marvelous, et cetera. But you also want to apply that level of scrutiny, which is, is this something that you would, you know, if we could, if we got the votes uh, to cap the downtown CRA, if uh, this was something that you would spend from the general uh, budget that, as opposed to other parts of the city, this, this to me clearly is. I mean, this is, this is a big vision project. I think it's wonderful. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm glad to support this and, and I can't wait to, you know, come for the ribbon cutting when we see the, uh, or whatever you're going to call it, whenever we see the finished product, because this is uh, historical uh, restoration and preservation at its finest. Board Member Miranda. 
Thank you very much. Like uh, colleague Vieira just said, that this is my second go around with this station. I had the honor and the pleasure of working with the Greco administration, redoing it the first time for the same items that were listed here. Windows, uh, termites, uh, falling apart, uh, different things that are not working. If I ask anybody to name me the two trains that used to leave there, can anyone answer that? Yes. <laughs> the one that had the big sign on the water, or the eastern seaboard. The silver meter and the champion. Two, two young those are the ones that went from here to New York <laughs> and back. And there was others, but those were the two main ones. So I remember as a kid, just watching that, I remember when the first train came down, that was a train that had, remember, the open, <laughs> go up to the second deck and, and had glass instead of metal and you can see and all oh, my uncle took me there to see something that was different and that was back in 1950 something and uh, it is what it is but I'm honored to, uh, to re help as with the other six uh, board members here to make sure that history is preserved in the city of Tampa along with the many memories of all the individuals who went to war and some didn't come back. Right. And uh, I'm honored to do this. Thank you very much. Okay, so, so thank you. we have a motion. Uh, since it's money, we should do a, um, what do you call that vote? A roll call vote. A roll call vote. Thank you. <coughs> Carlson? Yes. Hertek? Yes. Clendenin? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Vera? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Henderson? Yes. Motion passed unanimously. Okay, board member calls in. Yeah, just quickly, um, we also mentioned the Amtrak contract and service. Um, in the Amtrak contract, I, I think we could neg negotiate putting less space because then we could use it for some other purpose and activate the building. But the other thing is that um, the Amtrak service that we have was a hard fought battle to get and it's not guaranteed that we'll have it in the future. And I think um, the, the, the Friends of Tampa Union Station, other folks who are in favor of rail travel, will come to us and ask us to be supportive of, of uh, keeping the Amtrak service. And I'm told that we should also talk individually to um, uh, Kathy Castor and other uh, congressional representatives to make sure we protect that. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind with all the buzz of Brightline potentially coming in, um, think about uh, the adverse impacts it may have on, on the Amtrak service and on the, our airport. So um, we need to uh, keep all this in context as we're, as we're building new things, we need to make sure that we uh, upkeep and protect the things that we've invested in the past. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Wow. That <clears throat> Great. And we will move forward to the next item. I'll yep. invite uh, the East Tampa CRA manager, Mr. Cedric McRae, uh, to present on the next two items. Good morning, Cedric McCray, Tampa CRA manager. I'm here to re report out on item number six related to the Memorial Park Cemetery Veterans Monument. Um, at the request of Councilman Vieira, we have been in communication with uh, individuals from Hillsborough County Parks and uh, Facility Maintenance as it relates to the mo current monument and having discussions about restoration. These com Conversation started back in December, and uh, we've had some subsequent meetings um, in January. And um, I'd like to share a few things and just show the concept on the Elmo here. I don't know if you all can see that. Okay. And that's the first one. And this is the second. Oh, that's great. For your review, and um, there would be some, basically, a, ultimately a restoration of the uh, of the monument. Um, there is brick, there is marble, and then cement on the top. Um, the suggestion from the folks from Hillsborough County uh, would be that there would be a hand wash acid cleaning, uh, crack mitigation, and uh, to treat the brick and recoat and uh, grout repair, and then uh, possibly re replacing the uh, current plaque that is on on the monument and uh, then there's there's another scheme and that is the one that you're seeing here that uh, the, the same things would apply and uh, there would be a broader hardscape um, have had some conversations with uh, representatives from parks and recreation there was some concerns about the footprint being that there are current grave sites there so that may have to uh, be reduced to a certain extent but um, this is what we've uh, come up with thus far. And I uh, just wanted to hear your comments and 
Councilman Vieira. Board Sorry. Member Vieira. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ch Chairwoman. I appreciate that. And thank you, sir, for all your hard, diligent work on this. This is, you know, the, the restoration of this is something that came up. We had to clean up. Um, I guess it was Memorial Day last year, and County Commissioner Josh Wassel and I uh, were out there cleaning together, and, uh, and we talked about, um, you know, getting the county and the city together to restore this memorial, obviously very meaningful to Commissioner Wassel, who's a U.S. Navy veteran. And, uh, you know, th th we, we marked last year the 100 years after the uh, dedication of this. There was a wonderful ceremony. Uh, folks were there. I, I, I believe Council of Woman uh, uh, Henderson was there and her tech, I believe, were there. And uh, um, Tony Ellsworth uh, uh, did the, the ceremony and yeah. many other folks. And, uh, and it's great. And if you, it's funny, if you look at the history of it 100 years ago, it was a, it was a big thing uh, for Tampa when that happened. You had a, um, the Booker T. Washington branch of the Tampa chapter of the Red Cross uh, did the ceremony. You had uh, a gentleman, uh, Reverend Peter uh, Johnson, who was the pastor of St. Paul AME was there. Howard McFarland with the USS Tampa Post 5 American Legion was there. Um, Blanche or Brent, uh, Armwood uh, uh, Beatty was there, as well as um, Ephraim David Tyler, uh, a, a famous African American poet who was a poet laureate by, uh, appointed by uh, Huey Long in, in Louisiana, came and spoke. It was a big, big deal a hundred years ago, and um, and that day they were honoring the soldiers uh, who were uh, buried that day, and that particular memorial was for African American soldiers who never returned from world war, back then World War, now we know it as World War I. You know, but for me, the larger purpose behind this memorial, it really pays tribute to um, not just African-American valor and service in uniform, but particularly the, the, the time that I think is something that's so poignant. Um, after World War I, a lot of our American heroes who were African-American uh, came and returned home, and they expected to be treated like Americans because they went and fought for liberty overseas. Uh, many fought with groups like the 369th, the Harlem Hellfighters, and when they came back, um, you had many, many incidents of racial terror, white supremacist racial terror against our American heroes because they demanded to be treated equally. You had individuals whose heroism would not be uh, counted properly for many years. Um, there was uh, Henry Johnson, who would, uh, by President Obama, uh, I guess about 90 years later, given the Medal of, of Honor, um, he would fight off, I think it was about 30 Germans with a knife in the butt of his rifle, and he survived. Um, he would die about 12 years later in Washington, D.C. from his injuries. He was never properly compensated or cared for by the VA, by the way. Very tragic, and he's buried now in Arlington Cemetery. And, of course, in World War II, many of our heroes who would come home and, and, and fight for social justice uh, were World War II veterans. Many of our civil rights heroes, Medgar Evers was a Normandy veteran. Reverend Ralph Abernathy was a World War II veteran. Um, Hosea Williams um, who was in Selma uh, and survived two lynching attempts, by the way, here at home, got the Purple Heart and survived two explosions in World War II, a great American hero, so many others, uh, and, and onward to places like Korea and Vietnam for African-American soldiers who fought um, under Jim Crow for a country that wouldn't stand for them. And I know uh, Chairwoman Henderson, I believe your late father was a Korean War veteran. That's right. Yep, I, I remember that. So, you know, something that, that goes to the idea of aspirational patriotism, where uh, folks believe in their country and want that country to live up to its promise and be as good as their service to that country. You know, soldiers from the 54th um, uh, Regiment in, in the Civil War um, just so many, and, and this memorial really captures that point in time very well. So I'm glad to see this come forward. It's something that uh, just goes to the heart of our American journey, our American success from the heroism of soldiers and terrible American failures with how we treated those American soldiers, and, and to me, American shame. So um, this is great. Now, how long will this process take for this restoration? Roughly? Uh, we, we're gonna we're having some ongoing conversations. Uh, we're gonna have to pull Parks and Rec in to uh, to have some more conversations because I mean, ultimately, they're responsible for the site. Um, the we do have some financial numbers mm -hmm. um, for you know what what you see here on the screen. Um, the cost estimate was about fifteen thousand mm -hmm. um, dollars. So we're trying to see if we can have some conversations with Hillsborough County to uh, see if we can. 
they can, we can partner sure. uh, yep. with the financial cost of it. Um, and ultimately, it would be on their time schedule, but it doesn't appear that it would be an extensive period of time okay. to get I'll, it done. Then I, I won't motion for this to come back to city council. I'll just have, we'll, we'll I'll have an internal um, uh, clock uh, motion in there, maybe around Memorial Day or so. And, and I'll, um, if Brandon, if you're watching, if you could put that on the calendar in May, um, so that I can check with staff. And, and again, I know from the office of uh, uh, Josh Wilson, we talked about that and they were supportive. So I'm sure we can get something there. And um, and gosh, I think that's it. And it, let me ask you though, in terms of the fence, I know Councilman Carlson had mentioned that before after public comment. Um, should we have a, a motion for that to come back as a as a reminder or are we set to go with that? No, I, yeah. I think I think we're, we're good yeah. to go as it relates to the fence. Okay, good, Great. just making sure. I like reminders, that's the lawyer <laughs> in me, it's, it's how it is. But again, but thank you everybody for your work on this. This is a really uh, a wonderful thing that's very meaningful. So thank you guys. Thank Board you. member Miranda, you want to say something? No, oh, thank you okay. very much. All right, thank you so much, Mr. McRae. Yes. Uh, it is very evident that we care about Memorial Park Cemetery and that the work is progressing and we appreciate staff for doing all that they can to expedite. We know that things take time in city government. That's just a fact, so we really appreciate it. And we do appreciate the public comments, them reminding us, holding us accountable, uh, but it is clear that this board does care about Memorial Park Cemetery and Union Station. Um, is, these are great assets to our community. Okay, let's move on with the agenda. Okay, um, item number six is relates to the East Tampa Ponds. And um, no, eight. Eight. I'm sorry, eight. Eight. I'm sorry. Eight. Item number eight. Um, so we were eight. was requested that we come back with uh, cost estimates for the the ponds, the two ponds that were listed as a priority on North 22nd Street and uh, 26th, based on the renderings that I shared back in November with the CRA board. And I believe you have them in your packet, but I will put place the one for North 22nd on the Elmo. And the numbers that we received from the Parks and Recreation Department, I want to thank uh, Brad Suter and Nikki Coates for all of their assistance in helping us uh, come to these numbers. And um, yeah, so for 20, North 22nd, it was $235,000 um, as it relates to landscaping, um, some of the native plants and trees that would be planted along the uh, embankment or slope of the uh, pond. And um, I will pause for if you have any questions that relates to that. Board Member Mendescalco. Thank you very much, Mr. McCray. So we have members from the organization Hope in the back, and one gentleman did speak. Uh, and I uh, spoke to them a few days ago. And in April, they're having their big event, which I look forward to attending. So last year, I attended their event uh, at one church. I believe it was on Ehrlich Road. And it was a, a whole uh, group of you know, religious organizations, churches from all over the community. And uh, a question was asked if I would commit to, um, to conceptual designs regarding five of the seven East Tampa stormwater ponds and to straighten these ponds with native trees and plants. And um, I see we're making uh, progress here with 26 and 22nd. 26 is um, really spectacular, but you know, you see here it also includes not just the planting of, of trees, but uh, a boardwalk, and the boardwalk is is expensive at nine hundred and forty thousand um, dollars. I saw the conceptual designs for twenty six. It's beautiful. It's the middle of a neighborhood, uh, right next to the Italian Club Cemetery. Um, yeah, it's something that would be a, a major community asset that people can walk to. It's an area that's that's neglected and forgotten, but it's, it's got that residential density. And I think this would um, help serve a lot in the community. And 22nd Street, which many of us that, uh, you know, took part in the MLK parade a couple weeks ago, we walked right past that. It was on the parade route. Um, I've been to that pond uh, many times. It's fenced off. There's a community garden, which I believe is going to be relocated. Um, I, I believe I saw something like that. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I'm, I'm glad to see that we're making the investments. I see the canopy trees, 37, uh, understory trees. It doesn't say the species, but you have 29. And then you have native wetland landscape plantings, 5,600. Um, I guess it's by square footage. But one of the questions that came up in my discussion with Hope was, what about uh, 
help cleaning up that pond. The water quality, if you see, I don't know if it's algae bloom, if it's just algae in general, if it's contaminated, but um, I don't see here, and I want to know if we can add the, um, the, uh, the, the numbers to clean up the water quality there and just make it look prettier, make it healthier. Um, again, I, um, I'm glad to see that we have a dollar amount. I'm glad to see that we can move forward. Um, I did make a commitment to the group, and I'm going to go back on in, in April, and I want to, you know, tell the, the, the crowd in attendance that, you know, we have these numbers, and we're, we're getting the ball rolling, and it's not just verbal response, but, you know, the, the proof is here. Um, do we have, what's, what are the next steps? Do we have a start date where we start with 22nd and 26th? What about cleaning the water, uh, you know, for the water, investing in water qual quality cleanup, for uh, the 22nd Street, you know, guide me. What do we do now? So there's some additional conversations that we'll have to we'll have to have with sustainability, parks and recreation, and stormwater, um, and we, those have been ongoing. Um, as you know, with the restructuring of our East Tampa CAC, we just had our first mm -hmm. meeting last Tuesday night with the um, the new members. I think there were eight, and then one returning. So um, they have not had a chance to opine or discuss this. Um, the the numbers that I'm showing now, um, you know, for 2.4 and then another $230,000 or so, um, they have not had a chance to flesh out and discuss. So I would like the opportunity to bring it back to our East Tampa CAC in the next couple months. And um, then we would have to budget it out from the, the existing budget that we have for FY24. Would you have the opportunity to meet with the CAC before April? I believe it's April 15th or 16th that the organization is, is meeting. I think it's, yes, yeah, the 16th. Yes, I think we so. will. Um, we normally meet on the uh, first Tuesday of each month. Um, March agenda is going to be tight, so I think uh, April probably would be better for the, the CAC meeting. You said the first what of each First month? Tuesday. So there would be an opportunity for April and... I'll follow up with you to get a response to mm -hmm. see how the board felt, you know, where we go, because on the 16th, I'm going to attend and I want to, you know, give an update to the to the HOPE organization and the attendees. Um, would that give you time to see about uh, the cost and cleaning up the water at 22nd Street? Yes, yes. Okay. And we and we I've had some conversations with sustainability with Reamer mm -hmm. as right, well as right uh, Brad Suter yep. with Parks and Recreation. OK, no, I you know, I want to make good on my commitment. And um, you know, take it from here. So I appreciate all your hard work and Parks and Rec and everybody else. I know Wood is here. If if he has anything that he'd like to add. Hi. Uh, hey. Uh, good morning, uh, Council Whit Bremer. I just wanted to uh, add just a little bit of context on the water quality of the ponds. Those ponds are are actually intended to be water quality features themselves. So the fact that the poor water quality enters those ponds is exactly what they're intended to do and then the water is filtered before it moves down into the Hillsborough River or the discharge basin. Now let me ask you a question with these investments so let's say we we spruce up 22nd Street and the 26th Street is a, is a larger I'm sorry 26th Avenue at 26th Street is a larger investment um, and we put a boardwalk there and we make it into a complete park essentially for the community. Is it, what, is it as it stands, as the water quality stands, is it safe for, if I go with my two stepdaughters and have a picnic and walk around there, I mean, you know, we're near the water, we're not gonna get in the water, but is it, does it provide, does it, uh, uh, you know, affect health or is, is it safe to go or what? There, there are, um, I think the short answer is the, 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 the storm water is, is probably not gonna be, um, have any adverse impact to your health just walking around the boardwalk and stuff. But the idea of those stormwater ponds serve two uh, really important purposes. Number one, they were built in East Tampa to reduce flooding that occurred that actually caused some deaths in the 60s and 70s. So the number one thing they do is prevent flooding in the neighborhood. The second thing they do is provide water quality. So um, they filter that water before, like I said, it either goes into the aquifer or it uh, discharges into the Hillsborough River. So no adverse health impacts by uh, traveling to boardwalks or anything like that. Okay, so I will wait until the April CAC meeting and the timing I think is perfect. Hopefully we have an answer so I can bring it back to the folks on the 16th. And I thank you very much. Sure thing.
Okay, a board member Hertig. Thank you. Um, I think the 26th Avenue um, is great. It has all sorts of things. Um, I was honestly disappointed in 22nd Street only because it is a huge gateway for this community. Adding the trees is great. If you could put the um, uh, cost analysis back up. But one of the things I really want to see along that to, to just bring, again, just pride of ownership and understanding is a fence, like a nice fence. The chain link is ugly. And it doesn't, this is, this is a neighborhood corridor that we're trying at, with the CRA to make into business corridors, neighborhood commercial districts. Uh, it doesn't have to go around the whole, the whole pond, but certainly in the areas that it is traversed by the community, either walking or with cars or bikes, you know, and maybe adding some landscaping outside of that fence just to beautify the area. So absolutely trees inside, but what can we do outside the area to really show that that this community mean that it means something. Um, so uh, it's a your vision uh, is shared by both the community and staff. So actually, next week we have um, uh, a dis we have a design team that's under contract through a private donation uh, that's going to be coming in to redo a whole streetscape plan for that uh, to help assist with the CRA. So there are already some renderings that were developed by some USF students years and years ago. Uh, this is a professional um, design team based out of uh, Orlando that has uh, is taking all the community feedback, all the feedback that we've heard, and is actually producing renderings uh, with the moved garden, with the new fence, with uh, complete street features, uh, new plantings, shade structures. It's all part of our heat pilot program because we know this is one of the the hottest areas in that neighborhood. And then we're gonna use those renderings and all of the community feedback as the basis for a new grant request um, for EPA as well. So we, we, we share that vision of this being a really important corridor. We've actually um, approached the Tampa Family Health Center, which is located right to the north of the property to be our uh, official community-based organization uh, and uh, um, partnership with Hope and all the other organizations that are working. So we're, we're working on that right now. It's not just the tree plantings. That was what the CRA um, put in just their kind of specific plans because we don't have anything else uh, uh, mapped out yet, but we are working on that. Um, and, you know, if you are, that's great. And I would really appreciate a phone call later to talk about sure. it because one of the things that we have the issue with is that they've just created a community garden as part of Tampa Health um, Centers. Yeah. So. How do we create something that um, connects nicely with that, but also maybe goes above and beyond? Maybe some market space. Maybe like what are the other things that we can do to complement what's there while also developing what the community is asking for? So I would really love to talk to you about some of the um, conversations that Director Moody and I just had on Monday about this stretch. So um, I did not know that that was happening. That's very valuable information. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Happy to help. From member of the year. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, and I wanted to commend Councilman Meniscalco on this because I was there at that meeting and he really um, took this and, and, and ran with it. And, and it's great to see when you, you know, push something and, and, and you're seeing it through. And, and, that's, and that's wonderful, especially for the good folks at Hope who I, I see are here. And um, they're, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's always good to see people who are uh, representing themselves in a capacity of, of faith. And, and they're using that representation in that position to, to help people. There's always a lot of discussion about religion and politics. And I always say, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with religion and politics. There's nothing wrong with people of faith organized to be involved in politics. I think the test is, are you using that voice to speak out for people who don't have a voice? Right, and that this clearly does that for the marginalized, for for the least of these, and, and treating people as you want to be treated, etc. Um, and clearly, that's what this is about. So I, I'm, you know, fully supportive supportive of this. And again, it's it's uh, breathing life into the faith aspirations of uh, folks that hope that the, the Methodists, the Lutherans, Presbyterians, and, and Episcopalians, and, and different faiths and different folks who are there uh, to make a difference. And, and I think that's wonderful. So thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. McBride.
Um, move the required approvals. Second. Okay. We have a motion to move the approvals. Second by board member Mascal. Mascal. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, well, look, we are under new business. That's some Henderson leadership. Right no, there. that's not me. <laughs> that's just, we, that's just uh, the agenda for today. Any new business for transparency, for CRA, anything? Carlson, yes. We're in new business, right? Really? We are under new business. <laughs> um, the um, four or five years ago, um, we the council at the time, board at the time, approved a new outsourcing agreement between the CRA and the and the city. Um, we, we're separate legal entities, but we choose to hire or pay for the staff of the city. Uh, before that point, it, it was all interconnected and it was confusing about who was paying for what and and we made it um, very descriptive and it was, a, it was a conversation between city staff mayor's office and us to get that document done. Um, the, one of the results of it was an, uh, a, a standalone executive director. What we forgot, or I forgot at the time, was to make it clear that the, um, that the CRA paid staff report to the executive director. And uh, we need to have collaboration between CRA and the city. The CRA staff, because they're outsourced to the city, have to follow all the HR guidelines of the city. Uh, but it needs to be clear in a in a simple paragraph that um, that CRA funded staff report to the executive director um, just to make it clear, but also to make sure that we're that the executive director and then we as a board are responsible to make sure the CRA money is being spent correctly. So I would like to make a motion to ask legal staff to return on April 11th with an amendment to the outsourcing agreement between the CRA and the city to add a paragraph that clarifies that CA, CRA funded staff report to and are reviewed by the CRA executive director while meeting CRA and city guidelines and promoting collaboration with city staff. All those in favor? Do I have a second on that motion? I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Board Member Hartet, I think. Madam Scalpo? Oh, Madam yeah. Right. I do have a quick motion. Um, so. On April 11th, we're going to be having a CRA meeting where we're talking about potential amendments to the interlocal agreement. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of um, CRA members have talked about, and this is not a motion that would support or object to uh, CRA in the Sulphur Springs area. Uh, this is one where we would simply have that um, as, as a topic to discuss there uh, because if we're ever going to do it it's during that time when we talk to the county about our in a local agreement so I motion for a discussion on a potential sulfur spring CRA at the April 11th meeting where we will be discussing several motions that would require an amendment to the interlocal local agreement again this is not supporting it right it's just putting it on the agenda for our consideration for an interlocal local agreement attorney Massey am I off with anything here okay, okay. thank you because all I'm, right you know. Great. We have and, and I know, by the way, we already have two votes uh, against this. So it's not if you vote for this in my eye, it's not a commitment to vote for it in the end, just for discussion. How do you know there's like know. two votes uh, against it? How do you know that? He's like, listening. How, yeah. do you, public, how do you know from that? Public statements, <laughs> from public statements. Right? Oh, OK. OK. We have a motion on the floor by board member Vieira, second by board member Urtek. Comments, questions, concerns? Yeah. And, and I normally try to support everything that, that my mm -hmm. colleagues put forward. Um, as he just alluded to, Board Member Vieira knows how I feel about this. Okay. Um, I, I think that CRAs are for lazy policymakers, that we're not going to have any more money in, in Sulphur Springs by creating a CRA. What a CRA does, it, we, we can move the money now, especially if we put a cap on, um, on the downtown CRA, we can move money now to, to that area. The only way a CRA gets money is if there's development, and in particular massive development. And the way uh, the way that that usually happens is that, uh, look at Tampa Heights, look at Water Street, is that CRAs promise CRA money to developers for the purpose of building development so that money can eventually come into the CRA. And my conversations in Sulphur Springs is they don't want massive high rise, they don't want massive gentrification. And so I'm totally in favor of creating a strategy and plan to address um, uh, blight in Sulphur Springs. I just don't agree with a, a CRA. My problem with this also, though, is that uh, there is tremendous opposition uh, in, to creating a new CRA. And we could sit for a couple hours in public comment 
uh, listening to that. And so um, uh, there may be a lot of public comment about, about um, cutting back the downtown CRA also, but um, anyway, I'm just gonna vote against it for those reasons, thank you. Yeah. Um, yes. That's actually, that's the reason he's asking to bring it back because that's when we're talking about um, uh, limiting both the, the downtown and channel. That's so we could just have the conversation all together. And that's why I'm going to support it um, at this time. And may I? Yes. Thank you very much. And yeah, and, and I was going to mention that. Thank you, uh, Board Member Hurtak, on that. So um, there's a lot of give and take in our local agreements. So that's why I, I, I say this. And obviously, uh, the, the board members who have spoken out against the CRA, it's not because they oppose you know, improving things in Sulphur Springs. It's a means to the end thing, and I, and I respect that. Um, and also, I make this motion now in February as opposed to March so that uh, board members, myself included, uh, can talk to people about it over the next few months. I think that, you know, dialogue and education, et cetera, I think is very important uh, in everything. So that's it. Thank you. Yes, board member Carl. Just one other small thing. <clears throat> um, uh, Mr. Massey also asked us to move the, e the expansion of the e-board um, CRA to that date. And um, on April 11th. yeah, he has some concerns about our ability to expand. And one of the possible solutions would be to create a third CRA and Ebor. I'm completely against that also. Um, uh, and, and you know, pe people in South Tampa want a CRA and we could do a study yep. of certain parts of South Tampa, um, especially around McDill to talk about putting in a CRA. And so I think what we need to do is be better stewards of how we spend the money and allocate around the city instead of trapping money in and, and we could even create virtual CRAs, uh, but I even in Ybor City, I'm against creating one. Thank you. All right. Okay, you want to make a more comment on that as well? Yes. Um, it's, thank you. It sounds like that it would be a great day to really focus on a on a workshop of CRAs and w what we want the expectation to be. Um, we have, and so I'm just going to ask that no one add anything else to. Um, April 11th, and then in fact, a couple of these, we, we, things that are on the April 11th, if everyone would like to look at it, might, if we could move some of those, um, just, I mean, maybe even to March, I don't know. Um, I would ask Director Moody to speak on that because I wanna give, I want this to have as much, um, conversation mm -hmm. and space that we can to talk about it. Absolutely. We, okay. mm -hmm. um, Board Member Vieira. I can, after this motion's finished, I can move my uh, disability park improvements one uh, to the next month uh, or June, whatever. So I'll do that after, if I may. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor by Board Member Vieira, second by Board Member Hertek. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. And may I, um, Chairwoman? Yes. Um, I, I believe also did the King's Kids Learning in East Tampa. Mm -hmm. So I, I motioned that the items on Disability Park and K King Kids Learning be moved to the uh, May Second. Uh, CRA. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. No, not yet. I want something. <laughs> it's just comments. Recognize me? Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about the interim roles for Thrower and McCray for West Tampa and Drew Park. Are yes. they compensated for this additional role? Absolutely. Oh, good. Absolutely. That is so good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> no, that's important yes. because that's additional work and they deserve to be compensated. So, um, yes, ma'am. The other thing I want to say, um, and let me get through this um, without any motion. I really would like, on behalf of the Henderson family, to thank um, everyone up here on City Council, our legislative aides, the mayor, um, mm -hmm. Slee Kirk's office, the Tampa Police Department, the city attorney's office, Parks and Recreation, so many different staff as yeah. a group, individually, mm -hmm. the community, mm -hmm. Carver City, um, yeah. For the passing of my mother, the love, the support, just every kind word indeed, it's been absolutely incredible from the moment that I left here over a month ago. Um, 
when she became ill. So mm -hmm. she was an amazing woman, an amazing mother. But I really, really, really appreciate just how you all just have shown up uh, with your love and support and it is very important that I say that of course um, individual thanks is going to be very challenging um, but it does exist if you provided your address or you wrote your name and I can read it on your cards but nevertheless I thank you so much on behalf of my entire family uh, every day it is just really um, what we need on this new journey this new walk without her as her upcoming birthday comes this Friday so thank you so much for that and I asked a question about interim roles, so now we can do that move to what? Receiving file. <laughs> we have a motion to move and receive and file. All those in favor? Aye. Motion, I mean, we yes, have Attorney have Massey. Have do we have something else? Do we need a motion to not Oh, okay. No, I didn't want to do a motion, I just wanted to make a <laughs> okay. statement. Hey, let's not. Okay. Attorney Massey, anything else? No, I'm All right, this meeting is adjourned.